Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Friends of the DAO Saturday Star Party for December 18th, 2021. I'm Aaron Bannister, they, them, and I'll be your host for the evening. We've got a great show planned for you, uh, but first, we acknowledge and respect the Sanchothan speaking peoples on whose traditional territory the observatory stands and upon which we live, work, and play. We share with those peoples historical relationships with the night sky. If you're joining us on YouTube today, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. That helps us reach out to more people uh, and you'll get notified of any future star parties we have. We've got a, some great talks lined up for the next few months as well. You can find us on social media, pretty much everywhere at Friends DAO. And um, as well, we are a membership supported organization. If you'd like to join our team, um, becoming a member or a volunteer, you can find all the information on how to do that at centeroftheuniverse.org. Um, we are looking to open up sometime in the new year, uh, uh, COVID permitting, of course, um, but we've got some uh, interesting new exhibits that we're working on, um, as well as some other programs that we're bringing up to speed in anticipation of welcoming folks back to the center. Uh, if you'd like to be involved again, uh, visit us at centeroftheuniverse.org. Um, as we've got uh, our talks for the evening, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw those into either the Zoom chat or the YouTube chat. We'll have folks monitoring those. They'll pass them along to uh, me so I can ask our, um, our speakers and then um, our Ask an Astronomer crew. Uh, your questions don't just have to be on what our speakers are talking about. Any curiosities you have about life, the universe, everything, what we had for lunch, anything like that, uh, please feel free to ask. Um, let's see. All right. So um, first Aaron, off, Aaron yes. I was wondering if I could just uh, just uh, do a couple of things, if that's all right. Hi, I'm Lori, uh, one of the board members for the um, for the um, Friends of the DAO, and I just wanted to bring two things to your attention. Um, one um, was that we have the gift shop open. I know we're not open up up completely on the hill, but the gift shop is open for online um, for online shopping, and there are some. Uh, nice things for sure in there and you just have to go into it just go into onto our website and just click the link for uh, shop online and you can go and have a look and see what's uh, what's there we have uh, free delivery for anywhere in the um, Victoria region um, so just as, as soon as you do that we can get that um, we can get that sent out to you the other thing is that um, uh, we did uh, have a um, uh, donation drive uh, for the end of the year uh, it was sent out in a in a newsletter to all our members, um, and we would hope that uh, you might think about us if you are um, if you are thinking of um, uh, giving um, anything to some of the organizations that you support. And we would certainly appreciate um, appreciate any um, help that you can give us for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, there's some great stuff in the gift shop. I love the celestial buddies and the uh, black hole bag they all go in. Uh, and uh, yes, those donations really do help us out there. Um, they'll help us out in uh, training new volunteers and bringing new uh, equipment and exhibits to the center. Uh, every dollar uh, helps us out immensely. All right. Now, uh, first up in our agenda tonight is Don with what's up in the sky for this evening, uh, aside from clouds. <laughs> I did see some clear sky today, so there's always hope. Uh, can, you, can you see my screen right now with uh, yes, some of the planets and so on? That's terrific. So uh, hello, everybody. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the sky over the next month. And uh, first thing, as you can see, is we're going to talk a little bit about the, the planets. And the time is set to approximately 5 o'clock, as you can see here. And you may have heard a little bit about a comet, a, bright, a fairly bright comet, that was, in fact, the first comet discovered this year. It was uh, A1, meaning it's the first in the series. And so Comet, uh, unfortunately, Comet Leonard at this latitude is down quite low. It's actually about five degrees off of the horizon. So uh, it's really hard to see through the murk and moisture uh, uh, from this latitude. So even though we're actually hearing about it quite a bit in the news. And I just thought I'd... Uh, throw in the ecliptic here because that's kind of fun just so we can actually um, so we can actually see that in fact the planets are are on a line here we can see that Saturn is about halfway between Venus and Jupiter 
And, uh, and so Saturn is, is much, much fainter than Venus. And, and so it's, uh, you may have to look for it fairly hard with the, uh, with the Merc and so on. If I were just to take away the atmosphere briefly, you can see that further down, you can see the planet Mercury and Mercury will actually be visible in, uh, in, in early January. So that's something to look for around January 7th. It'll actually climb up into the evening sky. But for now, we can't cheat. We're going to have to put the ground back, and we'll just uh, just have a little bit a uh, little bit of a look at the nighttime sky here. And I th think most of you are actually familiar with most of the things in the nighttime sky. But uh, but let's just uh, let's just advance the time just a little bit here, and add a few constellations in as well. And so you can see that, uh, uh, see where Jupiter and, and uh, Saturn are. And in fact, uh, something you may actually find is a bit of interesting trivia if you play around with one of these programs is that the position that they say the sun is in in uh, astro astrology columns is not actually where it is in the sky. And in fact, a lot of those, one of the reasons why astrology doesn't work is because they, uh, they're typically based on the positions where things were about 2000 years ago and the earth has shifted on its axis since then, but unfortunately astrology hasn't caught up, but uh, astronomers are a bit more current than that. So we actually have a full moon tonight. And uh, so the full moon is, uh, is op obviously over here in the Eastern part of the sky right now. But one of the things to note about it is that uh, at this time of the year, it's roughly the highest uh, when it's at, crosses the meridian, the north-south line, it's actually at the same altitude above the horizon that the sun is six months later uh, in, in, at the beginning of summer at, uh, uh, at the sol summer solstice. So that's one way you can appreciate the height of the summer, uh, uh, summer sun this time of the year. The other thing uh, to note is that uh, we actually have, uh, oh, pardon me, I should mention, that uh, from now on, when we look at the moon, we'll have to think about the James Webb Space Telescope because it uh, is heading to a position behind the moon. And, uh, and so that's, uh, I think that will always stick in my memory from now on that, that whenever I look up at the moon, we're also looking roughly in the direction of the James Webb Space Telescope. One other thing to mention is that uh, the quadrant, I'll see if I can say it right, quadrantids Meteor shower is coming up on January 3rd and 4th, and that's a fairly good one. There's uh, typically about 40 meteors per hour under ideal conditions that you can see, and the uh, the meteors are coming seem to be coming from the direction of the constellation Bootes. Um, on the subject of, of meteor showers, earlier this week we had the Geminids, and some of you may have heard about a bright bolide or bright meteor that was seen flashing across the local skies. And I checked with local expert, David Balaam, and he talked to a few of his military contacts who, who track these things uh, somewhat better. And it turned out that it was probably a small chunk of asteroid that uh, terminated over Vancouver Island. And the estimated energy of the explosion was about one kiloton, and it likely dropped stones just south of Nanaimo. So if any of you are in the mood to put on your gumboots and go search uh, in the snow up island, uh, go to it. Uh, good luck. And you may find some chunks of, uh, of, a, of an asteroid up there in the snow. So I think that's, uh, that's about it for me tonight. And I'll just pass it on back to, to you, Aaron. Thanks very much. And I'll stop sharing. All right. Uh, now I'd love to introduce our main speakers for the evening. Um, Wes and Madeline. Um, Wes will be starting us off. Uh, he's a planetary astronomer with a focus on trying to understand the planet formation process. Since being awarded his PhD in 2008 at the University of Victoria, he spent much of his career performing telescopic observations of Kuiper belt objects and other faint moving bodies of the solar system, such as asteroids, interstellar comets. Uh, West specializes in measuring surface compositions through spectroscopic observations uh, and performing ultrafaint surveys to detect new objects. Uh, he'll be speaking with uh, Madeline Marshall, uh, who's a Tasmanian astrophysicist currently working as a Plaskett Fellow at the DAO. She studies supermassive black holes in the early universe using both simulations and space telescopes. 
Madeline is leading a JWST Cycle One program and is also involved in two JWST Guaranteed Time programs, which will study these quasars and attempt to answer some of these mysteries. They'll be uh, giving us a brief overview of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope and its upcoming launch, as, and then speaking about their research. Welcome, uh, Wes and Madeline. Hello. You can hear me perfectly fine, I gather? Awesome. Yes, we can. Yeah, so as you say, I'm going to quickly go over the launch itself, the few moments of terror that we should see quite soon. Uh, just so I can try to share screen here. That's the one. And then we go here and, oop, of course, the, there we go, present. Great, I'm sure you can see that now. Awesome. So um, first thing to talk about is the uh, launch vehicle. Uh, and I, I like to bring this up uh, as it's basically the most successful launch vehicle ever um, in the sense that it has the fewest failures. Um, it had the, the stat that you should keep in mind when losing sleep over uh, the JWST launch uh, uh, is that it actually has 80 consecutive launches that have been successful, perfectly fully successful, including the uh, most, uh, the, the most massive commercial launch by a federal entity. SpaceX has recently taken the most massive launch crown a little bit further, um, but this is a big rocket and really quite successful. There has been a couple of proper failures, the first and I think the third launch of uh, the Arian uh, versions way back when, but we're now on version 5EC, which depending on how you count is either version eight or version nine. Um, and this particular version hasn't really evolved because it's been, so freaking successful. So, you know, it, it's probably going to be fine. <laughs> um, a quick zoom in of what it, uh, JWST looks like uh, crammed inside this thing. Uh, I, I just can't get enough of this graphic. I find it impressive that we can fit a six and a half meter telescope inside a little capsule like that. Uh, and I don't say me personally, that of course we are the, the engineers that built this thing. It is really quite uh, an engineering feat. Um, and if you uh, care to know what a launch might actually look like, I found this video from a few years ago. Can you hear the audio for this? No, uh, that's too bad. You'd hear a, a countdown in French right now. Uh, this is letting go of the arms. The, the building here used to actually fall out of the way, but they now trust the rocket enough that they don't need to do that. Um, and these are the solid fuel boosters clicking in and off it goes. Uh, and this is like, the key moment, right? If this works, just about everything else should be fine, knock on wood. Um, uh, so hopefully this is the view we'll actually get, but you know, enough of that. Um, if you wanna lose a little sleep, take a look at this image. <laughs> so this is uh, right now JWST is attached to the bus uh, that is going to carry it to space. And so that is the framework that actually holds it to the rocket. Uh, the fairings that are on the outside of it are not actually attached to JWST. Of course, they're attached to the rocket itself. And there is this L-shaped frame that JWST sits on um, below which is another small rocket or you know, explosive, controlled explosive. This is the way that they lower it down to the rocket, which you would see below if you were to look down that hole there and attach it to the L-shaped frame. And when I saw this, I started sweating because there's just one tiny little cable up there holding it all together. Uh, anyway, well, enough of that. Uh, <laughs> um, it's launching from uh, French Guiana uh, and launching out over the Atlantic. That's that little, um, it's not a state, it's not country, It's something else colonial uh, and it's mainly forest, but it's a great, a great spot to launch uh, rockets from because it's near the equator um, and it can go out over big swaths of ocean. So if something fails, it doesn't land on, on people. Uh, so that's why that, that's the spot that they launch from. Um, very quickly, the orbit, uh, we are putting this thing into the L2 Lagrange point. And so this is a diagram of the Lagrange points and each one of these L points, one through five, represent the spots that the gravity between the earth, the sun and the centripetal, centrifugal force of the orbit itself cancel out. And so these are actually stable or in this case, semi-stable places um, that you can put something and kind of keep it there. I say kind of because the L1 and L2 actually have um, a bit of a drift that occurs, a bit of precession in the overall orbital dynamics that causes objects to move away. And so JWST will have to kind of pull itself back into place a little bit. And it will, as you'll see, actually doesn't orbit in a circle. Uh, in, in a perfect circle. You see it actually orbits in a circle with respect to the earth and then around the sun. 
um, here is the path that it's going to take. Um, so the first few stages of the rocket, including solid fuel boosters, will lift it up into a high Earth orbit. And then there's a small additional rocket that is strapped to the bottom of that L-shaped frame that I was talking about that gives it the big push. And then once it's on route, so to speak, once it's leaving the Earth behind, um, these are all of the steps that occur to make this thing from a compact little piece of engineering to an actual functioning telescope. Um, remember I talked about that orbit, this is the actual orbit that it will take. Um, and the reason for this particular orbit is because it's about the stable spot that we can kind of keep it without having to control it too hard, you know? Um, so it will drift a little bit and there are thrusters on it, which will help keep it in place a little bit if it drifts far, but this is basically the trajectory that it would take um, in the night sky. And I don't know if you've noticed the sun shield the four or five layers of amazing fabric that sit between the telescope and everything else is actually facing both the earth and the sun. Obviously the sun is the main heating source, but the earth radiation would actually be enough to keep this thing too hot to function correctly. And so this is the reason why it's not in earth orbit. We've pulled it far away from the earth because even just the nighttime radiation of the earth is too damn hot. <laughs> Gives you an idea of just how cold this thing is actually gonna be. Uh, and then here is the actual deployment. Um, I'm actually kind of glad you can't hear the sound from this particular video. They've chosen some really cheesy space music, um, but I think this is worth a look because it's engineering at its finest. Um, I'll just turn it out. part is always so fantastic. <laughs> I just want to comment since it's quiet. So it just needs to be able to do this correct once. Once, yeah. <laughs> uh, so all of the things that you've seen happen so far are actually, um, you know, they're obviously critical to the mission, but there's a little bit of slop that can occur. Right. So each one of the tensioning of these pieces of fabric, for instance, doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Of course, it's going to be because it's it's NASA. But this part and then the unfurling of the mirrors after are the two absolutely, totally critical moments that cannot go wrong. Um, and, you know, we we've asked engineers, uh, how do we know this is going to work? And the answer is always trust us. Uh, they, they really do believe this is going to work. But to give you an idea of of how precise that has to be. Just the, the unfurling of the two side sets of mirrors has to be within a couple microns. The, the surface has to be smoothed within a couple microns for this to work. That's, uh, that's amazing. Anyway, uh, I, I really do believe it is going to function. Um, I hope I haven't terrified you too much. I definitely lose sleep over it because I've got a lot writing on all this uh, and I'm really excited about it. Um, but that's the, the detail about the launch. Uh, Madeline, do you wanna take it away there? I'll stop sharing here if I can find my mouse. There we are. Unmute, share, PowerPoint, play. All right, and then make you small so I can actually see my slides. Alrighty, so now we've heard about the launch of web. I wanted to talk a bit about what's so great about it. So how does it compare to existing telescopes and what kind of exciting science can we actually do. So um, Webb is often really thought of as a successor to Hubble. So it's not a replacement in it. It's way better and different in a lot of ways. So one of the big differences is its size. So here's a video of the two side by side um, rotating and it's really highlighting the mirrors. So um, James Webb ex fully extended is the size of a tennis court, whereas Hubble is about the size of a school bus. So not really that different, but the key uh, is the size of the mirror. So for Hubble, it's 2.4 metres. For Webb, it's a 6.5 metre diameter. So it's way bigger, which is part of the problem. In terms of deployment, that mirror does not fit inside the Ariane 5 rocket. Hence, it has to be that weird shape so it can fold up. Um, but it has a six times the collecting area of Hubble, 
which basically means that we can get a lot more light from the objects that we look at in the sky. Um, and so one of the key things that this actually means is that the resolution of the images that we get will be much better. And so here are some simulated images of galaxies in the very early universe as they would appear with Hubble and what they'd look like with James Webb. And so we're just gonna have so much more detail to really resolve the um, structures of objects. And so that size will really help us in terms of understanding the universe. As Wes said, uh, Webb is further, so uh, it's at L2, whereas Hubble is obviously uh, orbiting the Earth. So it will be much more stable and it's able to observe in the infrared. So um, Hubble is primarily a visible telescope. So it sees um, the light that we see with our eyes. It sees a little bit of ultraviolet radiation and a little bit of infrared radiation. But the key difference between Hubble and Webb in terms of, I think, the science output is that Webb is primarily an infrared telescope. And so it covers wavelengths that Hubble just cannot see. And so why do we want to look at the infrared? Well, I am a galactic astronomer, and so I care about galaxies. And so light from galaxies that we see with our eyes, so in the optical at, at, for distant galaxies in the very early universe, that light is redshifted into the infrared. So because the universe is expanding, the light that was emitted by those objects in the optical is redshifted and elongated. Um, and then by the time we see it, it's actually in the infrared. So to observe galaxies in the distant universe, we um, need to start looking instead from the optical, we need to start looking into the infrared infrared wavelengths. So Hubble sees a little bit of the near infrared here. And so it can see quite a long way back. So into the first billion years of the universe's history. But um, Hubble, like some galaxies, all of their light is completely gone from the optical. All of their light is in the infrared and beyond, which means that they haven't been detected in these wavelengths before. So with Hubble. So that means that for these most distant galaxies, having the infrared capabilities on web means that we can actually see much further into the universe. And so I think we're looking at maybe um, 200 million years after the Big Bang. So really starting to look at the first galaxies and stars in the universe, which is really exciting. So that's distant galaxies and why we care about the infrared, but it also is important more close to home. So one thing about the infrared light is that it can travel through dust. So here is uh, an image of a, a nebula of um, star formation in our galaxy observed in visible wavelengths and in the infrared with Hubble. And so this um, kind of dark stuff is the dust. And you can see that if you look in the infrared, you can actually see all of these stars inside that that dust has been blocking. And so these are the stellar nurseries in the galaxy where stars and planets are forming. And so by going to the infrared, not having that murky dust in the way, we can actually start to understand those processes. So um, that kind of <laughs> raises the question then, so James Webb's great compared to Hubble, but what about other telescopes? So Here's an image of the existing telescopes we have today. So these four here uh, on the right are currently under construction, but the others are all currently working telescopes, all on the same scale. And so you can see James Webb right down here on the bottom left next to Hubble. So it's way bigger than Hubble, but it's nowhere near the biggest telescope that we have. Um, so I guess you think, well, why are we so excited then about this telescope? It's not even the biggest one that exists. But the key is space. So the infrared, um, infrared light that comes from the universe is actually blocked by our atmosphere. So here is a plot of the uh, percentage of light that's absorbed by the atmosphere as a function of, of wavelength. And so um, gray is blocked. So the visible light, when we look up in the night sky, we see pretty much all of the light that comes in. Um, the atmosphere is um, transparent. If we, uh, the, the ultraviolet, luckily for us, is blocked by our atmosphere. So this means we don't get burnt to a crisp every time we go out in the sun. 
The infrared uh, is a lot more patchy, and so we see some in, uh, infrared light from the ground. But generally, if we want to observe in infrared wavelengths, the atmosphere is just too much of a problem, and that's why we really need to go to space. So while James Webb certainly isn't the biggest telescope that exists, it's the biggest space telescope, and it certainly will be the biggest infrared telescope. And so this is all really why Webb is so exciting. So... Um, that's what's so exciting about Webb in terms of the architecture and what it should do. And so I thought I'd just um, hit the key science goals and topics that Webb aims to cover. So there are four. So the early universe, uh, the first galaxies and the first stars, then galaxies over time. So how do galaxies grow and evolve? There's a stellar life cycle. So how are stars born? How do they live? And then how do they die? And then other worlds, so planets around other stars, what are they like? Do they potentially harbour life? And so I just wanted to talk quickly about each of these different science uh, topics, key themes with Web. Um, I generally am going to talk about Canadian projects, um, but the first one is not. Uh, it's just a really cool one that I wanted to mention. So um, you may uh, have heard of the Hubble Deep Fields. So Hubble in the past, I actually saw, I think it was 20 years ago to the day today, um, was pointed at a blank part of the sky, the days on the end. And what it found was an image that looks like this. And so it just uncovered thousands of, of galaxies uh, in the distant universe. And so this really revolutionized astronomy it helped us understand how many galaxies are there in the universe, the very first galaxies and how they evolve. And so that's exactly what the JADE survey is planning on doing with JWST. So they will be observing a, a similar blank patch of sky and looking for about 30 days uh, and just seeing what we can find. So what part of this will be... Uh, finding some of the first galaxies in the early universe. So we'll get an image like this. It will have better resolution. It will be in the infrared so we can see more distant galaxies. And so I think this will be very uh, exciting to see what this project can find. So this early universe theme is very closely related with the galaxies over time theme. So the Jade survey will, will cover this as well. And then last month you heard from Chris Willett about the Canuck survey, um, which also will study and try and search for some of the first galaxies in the universe, but also really try and understand how galaxies evolve over time. And so instead of looking at a blank part of the sky, they focus on uh, observing a galaxy, well, many galaxy clusters. And so these galaxy clusters are effectively cosmic um, microscopes and help us, uh, well, I guess, magnifying glasses, and it helps us see the galaxies behind them much better. And so this is a kind of similar but different strategy and, and really is trying to take advantage of that magnification effect to see some of the more faint objects. Um, so the stellar life cycle is uh, something that I've never really uh, studied. And so I found this really interesting to research uh, earlier this week. And so one of the key, um, some of the key science uh, led by Canadians on this uh, project is to try to study brown dwarfs. So brown dwarfs are stars that never became stars. So they never underwent nuclear fusion in their cores. So they're bigger than Jupiter, but still just a ball of gas, just like Jupiter and our sun. And scientists aren't sure whether they formed like planets or whether they formed like stars, but were just kind of failed stars. And so with Webb, these teams are hoping to search for more uh, brown dwarfs and also study their chemical compositions and try and understand what, what uh, is actually going on in these systems to really understand their formation processes. Finally, other worlds, which a lot of people probably find the most exciting prospect uh, with Webb. So one big Canadian project uh, is the NEAT um, project. And so this aims to detect the atmospheres of exoplanets. So the idea here is that uh, planets around other stars, sometimes they orbit around the star in the plane uh, of our sky. So just like we see the transits of Mercury and Venus coming in front of the sun, we see this same process uh, with other stars. And so as these planets travel in front of the star, 
we can take a spectrum and measure the chemical composition of objects within that uh, of the atmosphere and see what what the atmosphere is made of and so with this hopefully we can start to understand whether other um, planets have atmospheres and what they're made of and potentially is there uh, are there planets out there that might be hospitable for life so that's a very brief and broad overview of all of the amazing science that we can see. There's so much that we'll be able to do with web. Um, and so if you're interested, there's a full list available online of all of the projects that are led by Canadians. Um, but I thought I would talk more about my project. Um, so I study supermassive black holes in the very early universe. And so today I just wanted to talk about their biggest mysteries and how we aim to solve them with James Webb. So at the center of pretty much every galaxy in our universe, there is a supermassive black hole. So these black holes range from a million to even a trillion times the mass of our sun. And so one way that we know that these exist is through their dynamical effects right in the center of their galaxy. And so here is a video made from images of the center of our galaxy over a period of 30 years. And so these circles are all stars right in the tiniest center of our galaxy. And you can see that they're um, orbiting something uh, at the location of this white star here. And so by uh, modeling their orbits and measuring these and um, we can find that the mass of this object is extremely large, but it emits no light. And so this is our supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star. And you may remember from last year that this, the work uh, associated with making these images uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize. So um, we know that these black holes exist and they certainly have a, a dynamical effect on the really local scale of their galaxies, but they can also have a very large scale effect as well. So here is a galaxy and you can see these extremely large jets coming out of it. And so these are radio lobes, so you can observe them in radio wavelengths. And they are very highly uh, energized electrons that have been ejected from the center of the galaxy. And this is due to the black hole at the center. And so you can see it's a really large scale effect here. And so what's happening right, right at the center of the, the galaxy again we've got this supermassive black hole uh, and it's accreting matter and so in this case it's uh, ejecting a jet um, so what happens here is that if there's any gas or dust right in the center of the galaxy it will uh, accrete into a disk and so because of the extreme gravity of the black hole this disk has to rotate very rapidly so the material in that disk is very fast which means it's very hot which means it radiates a lot of light. And so these accretion disks are the brightest objects in the universe. So the black hole itself is not emitting any light, but these accretion disks do. And so if we see one of these accretion disks, we call this a quasar. And as I said, they're the brightest objects in the universe. So we can actually see them at extreme distances. So we've discovered these quasars um, in the first billion years of the universe. And so we're really starting to push back and see some of the, the first black holes that must have formed. So that raises one of the key mysteries is how do supermassive black holes form? So um, you may be familiar with standard garden variety black holes in our very local neighbourhood. So uh, when a star dies, if it's kind of small, it will puff up and then just go away <laughs> into it and form a, a white dwarf. Um, if it's bigger, it will undergo a much more exciting end of life and will explode in a supernova. If it's a kind of small star, it will form a neutron star, which is uh, extremely dense. And then if it's a bigger star, it will uh, explode and form a much more dense black hole. And so these black holes, though, are between five to maybe 20 solar masses, um, and so they're, they're tiny compared to these supermassive black holes. So this is not what's forming a supermassive black hole, but we think maybe a similar process is, but the jury is completely out. We don't know. So some of the theories are that the first stars in the universe, we call these population three stars, 
these first stars would be bigger than, car- than stars in our local universe, which means that when they collapse, they'd form bigger black holes. So ma- maybe we're talking 100 solar masses, so still small relative to the millions of times the mass of our sun that we see these two way. Um, so maybe uh, what happens is lots of these bigger stars form in a cluster all together and then each of those collapses and forms a black hole and then they all merge together. So then maybe we could form a, a thousand solar mass black hole. So kind of we're getting there, but they're still pretty small. Um, and then the last and I think most promising scenario is if there are extremely rare conditions in the early universe, we could have a supermassive star, which would then collapse into a supermassive black hole. So maybe um, 10,000 times the mass of our sun. And so that would really help explain why we see such massive black holes in our local galaxies, but also particularly galaxies in the early universe. So as I said, we see these quasars in the first billion years of the universe. So here's a plot of the black hole mass as a function of the time since the Big Bang. And so these are our observations that 700 million years after the Big Bang, we've found black holes with a billion times the mass of our sun. And this is just (laughs) really confusing (laughs) why these things exist. So these masses are similar to the masses of black holes in our local universe. But those ones have had 13 billion years to form and these ones have had less than a billion. So it really raises a lot of questions about how they've formed and how they've grown so quickly. So one thing that we can do is um, measure the mass of these first quasars uh, and then trace their um, growth back in time. So there is a cosmic uh, speed limit of growth called the Eddington limit. And if we assume that they accrete uh, at this maximal rate, we can trace their mass back through cosmic time and work out what their mass was when they were formed. So these are these three scenarios that I talked about before. Um, the, the remnant uh, first stars are really too small based on the current measurements, we're really looking at having to have really massive first black holes which have grown extremely rapidly, which is also a problem. (laughs) So it's a lot of problems with this. Um, So hopefully JWST can start to answer a lot of questions. So first of all, the way that we can measure masses of black holes will be much more accurate with Webb. And so hopefully this, um, these, these masses will be more accurate and hopefully we'll be able to trace back Uh, better. Also, there are some theories that we may actually be able to detect the first black holes before this quasar phase, maybe back here at the really first stages of the universe. I don't know how that will work. (laughs) Some people are very hopeful. So, I mean, that would be extremely helpful if it's true. (laughs) So we'll see how it goes. So that's the first mystery is where the, how do they even form and how do they grow so quickly? And a very related question is, What kinds of galaxies do they live in? And so this is what I generally focus most of my research on. So um, here is what a quasar host galaxy looks like in our very local universe. So if we look with Hubble, so you can see the beautiful galaxy structure. You've got a nice spiral arm on this one, two of them, and your extremely bright quasar at the center. So it just looks like a really bright star in the galaxy right at the center there. And so from these, we can measure very detailed properties of galaxies. So how much mass of stars are, is there? What are their sizes, their structures? Uh, and we can also measure obviously the properties of the black hole as well. And that can you know, really help us in trying to understand the relationships between black holes and their host galaxies and how they evolve and, and what kind of what processes form these, these black holes. So... This is in our local universe. I say local, it's local for me. We're talking one to two billion light years away. Um, If we go much, much further, so now we're talking uh, 10.4 billion light years away. So redshift two, if that's something you're familiar with, this is what we look at. So we're looking again with Hubble and now we've just got this weird blob thing. Um, And what this is, is the point spread function or PSF of the telescope. And so what what the point spread function is, is it's the way that the telescope optics uh, respond to observing a single point of light on the sky. So if you were to observe a star with a telescope, any telescope, you would notice that it's not a single 
pixel on your detector, it's, it's actually spread out. So it's usually a circle if you're from the ground because the atmosphere smears it. But when you're in space, we don't have that issue. Um, and it really depends on telescope optics. So for Hubble, you have a nice circular mirror for your primary. And then your secondary mirror is held up in front of the primary by support structure. That support structure actually causes an X shape in your point spread function. And so depending on your telescope and how it's designed, how the optics work, your point spread function will be different for different telescopes. So luckily though, this is something that we can measure and we can model. And so given that we can do this, we can actually subtract that quasar light, so subtract the PSF and see what the, the smooth extended emission from the galaxy is. And so now we've got this galaxy, we can make the measurements like we can in the local universe and everybody's happy. So this is a proven process and it does work, but if we do the subtraction for the first quasars, so those that are less than a billion uh, years into the universe's history, this is what we get. So you can see the PSF much clearer here because there's no, there's no galaxy underneath. So it's this really funny X shape. But if we do the subtraction, there's nothing left. This is just noise. Um, it's just um, nothing, no actual galaxy. Now, this is not because there's no galaxy there. That black hole does live in a galaxy. It's just that we can't see it. So in the very early universe, galaxies are much smaller. And so with the resolution of our best instrument so far, Hubble, we cannot distinguish the light from the galaxy from the quasar. And so basically the galaxy looks like a point source, quasar looks like a point source. Who knows what comes from where? We can't see it. And so that means we can't detect the host galaxies of these very early quasars. And so it's really disappointing in terms of trying to understand what's going on in these systems. We've really hit a roadblock, but that's, all about to change. So with web, we think that the improved resolution will be able to actually distinguish these host galaxies from the quasar for the first time. So I actually am primarily a theorist, and so I've done lots of theory to try and understand how web will perform when trying to do this. And so here we've got um, some simulated images of a quasar host galaxy in Hubble uh, and with web. So here is the uh, PSF shape for web. And so you can see it's not an X shape anymore. It is an absolutely disastrous, weird looking blob thing, um, <laughs> which is because instead of being a nice singular mirror like Hubble, James Webb has 18 hexa hex hexagonal shaped mirrors. Plus then also you've got that support structure. So this is why that looks so bizarre, but that's okay. Again, we can model it and, and measure it. And if we do the subtraction, this is what we're left with. So here, um, this on the right is actually the, the mock uh, galaxy that is underneath here. So it's a simulation. So I know what we're trying to find. And so I think that this really amplifies the problem that I'm dealing with here. We're trying to find this underneath this. So these images are both on the same color scale. How, <laughs> how are you going to find this under here? I mean... This is how detailed and, and hard this, this task is. So anyway, so with our simulations, we found that um, we, we can do this subtraction and we found that with Hubble, this is not detected. So it's just a bit of noise here. Whereas you can see that with web, we've actually made a detection. Um, and so we found that in the same wavelengths and exposure times, Hubble would detect none of the host galaxies while JWST will be able to detect 45% of them. And so by playing around with different wavelengths and uh, exposure times, we think that James Webb will actually be able to detect between 80 and 100% of quasar host galaxies. So we're going from detecting nothing to potentially detecting almost all of the host galaxies that we observe, which is absolutely phenomenal. And so there's going to be a huge advancement in, um, in our understanding of, of quasar host galaxies. So obviously that leads us to my uh, grand plans with James Webb. So my team and I have been awarded 16 hours in the first year of, of JWST observations to observe two of these quasars. And so what we're going to do is take images of them. And so we'll do this quasar subtraction. And the really key question is, 
we want to observe that galaxy for the first time and find out what kind of galaxies do they live in? What are their sizes? How many stars are they forming? What are their masses? What morphologies do they have? Are they undergoing galaxy mergers? And then one of the other key questions that we will hope to answer with our data is where do these galaxies live? So are they in very dense environments in the universe or are they quite isolated? And this can help us understand what kind of, um, what is actually causing this extreme black hole growth? Like are there lots of galaxy mergers and, and all sorts of crazy things going on or are things quite isolated? And so we think that um, our project and certainly all of the other projects that are planned for JWST in cycle one um, should really start to answer a lot of these questions that we currently have. So it's really exciting time. Um, we should be able to do a lot of great science with web. Thanks so much, Madeline. That was excellent. Um, would you like to take any questions now or shall we go right into Wes and then do questions at the end? Take them now while it's fresh. Okay. Um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but I have a question have, for you. I have one too. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Hi, Madeline, it's Laurie. Um, I just, uh, that you, so you've got these, these hours that you're going to be looking on for two quasars. Mm -hmm or two of them. How did you decide which ones to look for? <laughs> yeah, this is a really good question. So we've done this for Hubble with seven. So we had seven to choose from. They were the, the seven in the first place were very carefully chosen. So they were chosen because we think that the stars in the galaxy would be quite bright, whereas the quasar itself should be quite faint. So there are a few ways that you can work this out, but so it was selected that way. So the contrast is not so bad. Um, so that's how we selected the first seven. And then we, <laughs> then it was kind of a process of which, which are the best ones to use. So one of the key things for these are they both have ALMA observations. So they have really detailed ALMA observations. And so with ALMA, the quasar isn't in the way. So you can actually see the host galaxies. You can see the gas and the dust that is in the galaxies, which um, can tell you a lot. Though we think that those observations will be quite different to the stars, which is what we can see with Webb. So we really needed the ALMA, and so we picked ones that already had that. Um, and we also selected two. So one in the images with Hubble looks like it's quite isolated. The other one looks like it has two very nearby galaxies and so it's potentially undergoing a galaxy merger. So we kind of chose them out of maybe one, yeah, trying to work out which ones might be the most interesting out of those. Yeah, so it was really available resources plus what do we have the best chance with? But that's a really good question and I've thought about it a lot. <laughs> you're muted. No, you're muted. Um, did you have to make all those decisions and everything like to put in your proposal. Absolutely. Like, so was, okay. Yeah. So with James Webb observations, pretty much your entire observation has to be planned, ready to go before you are even awarded the time. So it's very difficult. And there's a lot of prep work, obviously worked out well for Wes and I, because the work was done yeah. and it's good to go now. <laughs> But there's a lot of work to do if you don't get awarded time, which is very unfortunate. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So was... all of this had to happen beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, good luck. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, we also have a question from Dawn. Um, is there any discussion among theorists that the supermassive black holes may have been seeded by conditions in the early universe? And I think you touched on this briefly at the very beginning. Uh, can you yeah. elaborate a bit? Yeah, it, it really depends, I think, on the, the, the dark matter halos and the gas that, that collapses into those halos, so the first galaxies, and how whether they just uh, fragment and form lots of individual stars and then form those population three stars, which then collapse into small black holes, or if the conditions are just right, potentially that whole cloud of gas of this first galaxy would form one star and then you would form one of these extremely massive black holes. Um, 
Yeah, so it really depends on the, lo- well, the idea is it would depend on the location of the halo. So potentially in the, so in the very early universe when really nothing like this is, no galaxies or anything have formed yet, maybe the most dense regions would have this um, condition that it, it works for, um, whereas really isolated regions of the universe, maybe this kind of extreme event won't happen. So, it's, yeah, it's, there's a lot of theory about how do you go from, like, the, the cosmic microwave background, the, the soup, uh, how do you get galaxies from that and then where, where would that they form? So there's definitely a lot of work on that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, Don's um, posted a uh, um, clarification as well. Uh, he was thinking more like in the first few seconds after the Big Bang, like primordial yeah. black holes. Um, Pri- I don't know anything about primordial black holes. <laughs> but okay. yeah, certainly the first few seconds after the Big Bang in terms of when everything, yeah, I don't know. Don't know. Fair <laughs> good, enough, fair good, enough. Good question. <laughs> Yeah, maybe Ruhi and I can toss it back and forth at the mm. Ask an Astronomer. Um, let's see. Uh, Amy asks, uh, will there be any sort of camera that will be live streaming the telescope opening? Um, like, do we get any visual feedback or is it uh, all just don't... engineering reports? Uh, I, so it's been announced today slash yesterday that it will definitely launch on the 24th of December. And so since then, I've seen a few email threads about how do you, watch web can you actually observe it with the telescope so i've seen a few guides i can certainly forward that on to your team if you're all um interested oh in we trying gotta to get track. our um our, uh, yeah uh, should get the know, plastic yeah, telescope out yeah. it's <laughs> definitely it's definitely big enough that in yes. its early stages as it unfolds you should actually be able to see yeah. uh you know like it's like taking a 12 inch telescope and staring at the iss you can see the solar panels and stuff it should see similar yeah. uh with this thing before it leaves us yeah, oh, that's so there amazing. are a lot of people getting ready for the weekend, working out exactly where to look and when. And so it, it should be possible. I don't know to what point it will be possible. I think after it's gone too far and potentially with the sun shield blocking most of the telescope, mm-hmm. I don't know how that will. I, I was really tempted to ask to try and point Keck at it, but uh, <laughs> I didn't get there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe we can uh, convince someone at the Plasket to, uh, yeah. to point there. Yeah, let's um, try. We'll, we'll try and sort that out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've got that great imager on it. Uh, I'm just getting like <laughs> images of that Star Trek movie where they're, they're looking at the Enterprise through that little telescope. <laughs> the key, if you're going to try it, is to have uh, very f- high frame rate video cameras uh, that will be able to snap out and still some of the atmosphere for you. Right. I don't know if the plastic can do that. Well, it, I shouldn't say no. I've used it for occultation and stuff before, but it's, uh, let's call it an unsupported mode. <laughs> <Fair>. <laughs> well, we'll talk to Dave Balaam. Yeah, exactly. All right. Aaron, yes. Aaron, on here. Could I just make a correction to something I said at the beginning? I, I said about looking in the direction of the telescope and the moon, and that uh, would occur at full moon only. So, um, and I just have a question for our, our speakers. Uh, will there be a, like a say an hour long data dropout when that happens? When will the moon eclipse the actual communication with the telescope for about an hour or something like that a month? No, I'm pretty sure we don't have that uh, because it's on that not perfectly L2 orbit, you know, where it does that circle that I showed. It shouldn't, as far as I understand, it should almost never be uh, occulted by the moon. Okay. Yeah. And so there's a key part about so if it was exactly at L2, it would be in direct line with the Earth and the and the Sun, but then we need the solar power from yep. the Sun, <laughs> so it needs to not be exactly at L two, <laughs> otherwise yeah. it's got to power. <laughs> I only learned that recently. I was very fascinated, but of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Of yeah. course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, opposite. I guess it's always opposite the Sun. I guess that mm-hmm. would be how you find it in the night sky. Is where is not the sun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, thank you, Don. Um, I just have uh, one last question. Hopefully it won't take uh, uh, too long. Um, but um, the um, you mentioned the point spread function for, for Hubble and how it's an X shape. Mm-hmm. So that, that means it's sort of the struts are aligned so that there's um, diagonal uh, projected onto the detector. Is there any reason it wasn't straight on? 
No, so those that, that X shape was actually caused by the standard diffraction bane of a, a of reflecting mirror telescope in Newtonian, for instance, for example. There's a secondary and it yeah. sits on two horizontal struts. So there's almost no way to avoid that uh, yeah. with that sort I, of optic. I, yeah, it has yeah, to be sorry, held just, up. I, yeah, I know it's the struts that caused that, but is there yeah. any reason those struts weren't oriented so that they projected like along the lines of the detector rather oh, than the I diagonal? See what you're oh, yeah, I see. I think it's just a function of where they can actually squeeze the cameras into the field of view. Fair yeah. enough. It just seems and it doesn't very... really matter either. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. guess if you can do the math to subtract it out, then it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it happens to be lined up with the grid of pixels. Yeah, it makes no difference. Yeah. 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 I wonder yeah, if it's, it's easier not to worth like... worrying about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or maybe like it's easier to, to pull out saturation um, washing, that sort of thing. Yeah, potentially, because it would saturate along the same direction. And so you wouldn't know if that was a weird lopsided tail or, yeah, yeah. May maybe it's on purpose that it's not aligned. Okay. I don't, um, I don't know if they thought yeah, that much not, about it. I'm not sure either. <laughs> I suspect it's Fair probably enough. an easier software problem than it is uh, an engineering problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Amy uh, posted a clarification on her question about the, the uh, JWST opening. So there's no like onboard camera on the telescope no, that would be isn't. streaming that. Yeah, I, as I understand, yeah. the data transmission rate is quite limited from-, from Well, there isn't even a, a camera pointed at the telescope to, to measure all of that. That would be a very expensive addition. And as we all know, JWST is already beyond its budgets. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're we're yeah. all very spoiled by the Mars missions that have booms with cameras looking back at the, the rovers. Yeah, uh, and okay. in terms no of the fairing the JWST. as well, the- um... Because I don't know if they're, at the, I think there is currently a, a, a camera inside the fairing. Yes, so I'm we can sure still see what's going on. Yeah. But basically, as soon as it launches, well, I mean, it, I guess it's dark as well. So I don't yeah. know what kind of camera it is. Yeah, once it, once it gets once away it, yeah. from the, 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 the launch stage um, and then the fairings break off, we basically won't have any footage yeah. of it from in, in situ. Yeah, because right. the fairing goes away first. So one, <laughs> and okay. that's, that's the, the easy that's part. The important stuff. Yeah, the easy, <laughs> yeah. God, easy part. <laughs> we'll yeah. be relying on our EAA team then. Um, and I, there's a question that looks like someone was asking, Amy was asking how long until we're going to be observing, knowing that it's actually worked. And I think the, I think the answer is if anything catastrophic were to occur, it's ours but to know exactly how well it's working its months. So I think mm -hmm. there's sort of a three month engineering phase testing and so on and so forth that needs to occur. So is, is that right, Melanie? Yeah, yeah. So the first, I think it's about first three months is make, like turning the instruments on and getting them working. And well, the first whole month itself is just building the telescope. Um, <laughs> it has to build itself. What a tough job. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so it, we have to get all of the instruments operational and happy and then the mirrors have to be aligned which will take a while so that actually the first images that will come from web will be <laughs> quite ugly it will be they'll look at a point source it's kind of like my point sources but be, what will um... happen is they'll see it with all 18 mirrors because they won't be aligned and so they will one by one align each mirror so the point sources will slowly overlap each other and by the end of that process which i think takes weeks i, I can't remember but it's a long time that's what i've heard as well yeah you have to <laughs> align all 18 to the exact same spot and so mm -hmm. <laughs> that that will take a long time and so once that then happens we go through then a science commi commissioning phase so yes the instruments are on we can contact them but do they work in the way that we want them to? I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so you'll start out with like a mess and then it'll slowly, slowly become an absolutely disastrous, uh, weird looking blob thing. Yeah. So I think maybe about three or four months until we have legitimate images working. And then after that, it will be uh, a process of a few months of, of getting all of the, the science kind of working. So calibrations and and checking that everything makes sense with what we predicted from the ground so does that psf that we observe 
look like what we thought or does it look completely different and what's going on and with the spectroscopy is that all working to spec like um i guess so i don't know if you know about the the spectroscopy but the shutters open and close and so i guess you test which ones are open and, and which will work and all of that kind of stuff so it's a huge process so it actually will be six months from launch until the first actual science observations so it's um <laughs> takes a while because obviously it's it's not like Hubble where it just went up and it was ready because it has to build itself and then it has to be <laughs> commissioned in space so yep. yeah it's a long process yep. but not long in the grand scheme of JWST which has been 20 years so <laughs> yeah no kidding <laughs> all right um and uh Quick final question before we head on to Wes's talk, because I'm eagerly anticipating that one as well. Uh, is there a secret backup JWST built that can be sent <laughs> up in three months if this all goes, side goes sideways? <laughs> I always thought that they should have just built a second because I think what took so long was all the technology development. Like yeah. how much really would a second one cost us? <laughs> so uh, I'm going to tell an anecdote here. I was in, I was giving a talk at Goddard about this sort of Kuiper Belt science that we'd be doing um, if we were to give, be given the time. The day that they turned JWST on its side and un opened up the, the secondary, first time ever that it was actually in telescope form with the, the panels out and everything, it was a spectacular thing. And so I got to stand in front of the view window of the engineer lab with this huge honking golden mirror shining back at me. Uh, and while that was happening, I, I pulled up the guts to ask one of the engineers, you know, what, what happens if this blows up on the launch pad? Because no one has really addressed this before. Uh, the, the first response was, uh, quote, unquote, what the hell is the matter with you? Uh, and then we finally got into the conversation that I wanted to have exactly asking that how much would a second JWST cost? And the answer is nearly 10 billion. Um, because they, every one of the every single thing in that telescope is a one off. And one-offs are very expensive and very hard to repeat. And so you almost don't save anything. Like to build a second Hubble would be much, much more expensive now, even though we've had one for 30 years. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> yeah, I had, I had the guts. I had to ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we're all crossing our fingers. Indeed. Um, all right. Let's uh, move along to uh, hear about Wes's research. Let me know if we, I know we talked for a while there. Let me know if we're running short on time. I'll, uh, I'll finish quickly if need be. No problem. Uh, play. I did it again. Talk. All right. So um, uh, this is a fishing expedition that I'm going to talk about uh, where we are pointing a uh, JWST at a blank spot in the sky and trying to find ultra faint Kuiper belt objects. And by ultra faint, I really mean at 20, 29th magnitude in, in V. Uh, the two other partners in crime that I have, uh, John Stansberry, who works at Space Telescope Science Institute as the near cam, one of the near cam scientists, uh, and is really the, 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 the person that pushed on us, stood on our throats to get, get this science prepared. And David Trilling, another uh, person like myself who has lots of experience in time finding Kuiper Belt objects on the sky. Um, so uh, what is the Kuiper Belt? This is always a, a something that's worth talking about. And so this is a rendering I pulled together of most of the solar system. And so every one of these points is in fact a real object. Uh, you can see the gas giant planets there. Um, you can even see the Jupiter Trojans. Um, the uh, Kuiper belt is basically all of the small dots of various colors, purple, red, and such. They've been uh, uh, colored by dynamical class, uh, which I find is a very interesting thing because it gives you a sense of uh, spatial structure. Um, what is also worth pointing out here are all these circles. Uh, the points that have been circled are the, uh, the 10 dwarf planets that sit in the Kuiper belt. And so these are basically the largest objects like Pluto. Um, and if we uh, we'll talk about in a little bit. I'll even point out to you which one of these is the Arakoth flyby target. Um, I like this animation because the orbits here give you a sense of the scale of just how big the solar system really is. And we can see with current ground-based technology about to the extent of where you see the points right now. But of course, the orbits of these objects take them much, much, much further out than where we find them when they're particularly close to us, at particular close being 50 or 60 AU. Um, 
So, you know, for, for Madeline's perspective, they're, they're on top of us. From my perspective, they're as far as it gets, but not so far that we can't fly a spacecraft to them. Um, so here are what Kuiper Belt objects look like, big and small. Of course, there's Pluto on the left with its uh, famous broken heart, and then um, Erikoff on the right, the red snowman. Um, I find this, uh, these images don't do the, 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 the the, the structure of these objects any real justice because Pluto here is, is shinier than white snow and Erikoth here is darker than my shirt. Um, uh, it's, it's, it is red, but it's been enhanced so that you can see it. Um, and they're, they're wildly different. Uh, the, the process that creates a Pluto is very, very different than the process that creates an Erikoth. And that is the theme of our JWST program is we're trying to find and simply count the number of small Hyperbelt objects, which provides us a data point by which we can constrain planet formation processes. I personally don't actually care about the Kuiper Belt. I care about planet formation, and the Kuiper Belt happens to be the tool for the job. So these these pictures are really pretty, but you know the it, it's the, the the theory of planet formation that I actually really care about. Um, so just to point out, those are the two flyby targets there as of 2017 when I happened to pull this image out of the animation, and you can imagine the New Horizons uh, spacecraft drawing a straight line basically between those two points to get us this fantastic imagery. I, I just like that bit of context. Um, so the, there's two general ways that we think uh, we've theorized that planets form. And of course, there's lots of details and all of this sort of thing. But um, the, the first mode, and this is sort of the classic mode that was presented maybe even 100 years ago, um, is hierarchical growth, where small things stick together, like collide and stick, and they make bigger things as bigger things collide and stick and make bigger things still. There might be a phase in which the biggest things are now collecting predominantly small things and growing that way and sort of skipping the middle parts. But at the end of the day, it's the biggest stuff that governs the growth from the smallest stuff. And so I call this a hierarchical growth because you start small and go big with multiple stages in the way that clearly like a ladder. Um, and you know the, the, the down to earth comparison is of course, just driving down the highway. Um, I, it was funny, Madeline, when you showed the JWST PSF, I was like, oh, that's what my windshield looks like. Um, uh, anyway, so you know, hierarchical growth is basically the late stages of that are bugs sticking small Kuiper Belt objects smashing into Pluto. And we can see that because of course, Pluto has small craters all around its surface. And so while it was growing, uh, before it failed to grow up into a proper planet, uh, we can see that this stage was actually happening. Um, the other phase is a new idea that's sort of come around in the last 15 years or so. And it's from, it's basically called gravitational collapse. And so this is an, a, a, a simulation done by one of my colleagues uh, that simulates the interaction between gas and dust in a box that is co-moving around the sun. And so, um, instead of thinking about the solar system as a stationary place and objects orbiting the sun, we now take the box and we sit on a box and we move around the sun with it. Okay, so the sun is to the left. And uh, so what happens here in this, this initial gas phase, you can see these streamers that show up um, and the stuff on the inside is moving slightly faster with respect to the stuff on the outside. So that's where you get this rotation, uh, this sort of shearing that occurs. Um, but the reason why these streamers are showing up is because there is gas and dust together. And so, um, I don't know if you've ever watched the Tour de France, um, but the, uh, you put a person in the front of the peloton, and then that person does basically all of the work carrying uh, everyone along behind it because it creates a vacuum that allows the other cyclists to keep up with less energy. And it turns out this was actually a process that was completely missed uh, until my colleague Andrew Uden uh, uh, wrote the paper, the fundamental paper that, or the, the primary paper that describes the streaming instability where the same back reaction in the peloton occurs, but in these places. Um, and the reason why this is actually really important is because you get these spots of very high, these blobs of very high dust density, which is what you're mainly seeing in this animation here. And so now take one of those spots and idealize it a little bit, give yourself some pebbles um, and take a look at what happens. And so forgive me, this is now the same sort of box co-rotating with the sun, but the sun is pointed down. Um, this is some work I've done with uh, some, uh, Jamie Robinson, one of my PhD students. And this is what I call the vomit cam. Um, every one of these purple little points is a pebble in one of those animations. And very quickly you see the same 
sort of thing happening where if you just look, you see initially these streamers that show up, but predominantly what's happening here is just self-gravity of the cloud pulling all of those pebbles together. Now on the right side, what you're seeing is a zoom in around the most massive object. And anytime there is another appreciably massive object orbiting it, um, you, you get that the ellipse shown there. And so this is what a cloud looks like if you take enough pebbles and put them together so that when the dust goes away or when the gas goes away again, the cloud still remains. And unlike the hierarchical growth process that can go from dust to planetesimals in say 10 million years, this happens in less than the time scale of one orbit of the sun. So we're talking formation periods of uh, formation time scales of about two or 300 years in the Kuiper belt. Um, and so it's a very, <laughs> the reason why it took us so long to appreciate the importance of this is because it's a completely alien time scale uh, for astronomers. You know, it's not so alien for human lifetimes, um, but it was almost unreasonable to think that you could form planetesimals so quickly. But as it turns out, one of the features of this uh, mode is that you produce binaries. This is the reason why I'm showing this, the vomit cam on the right there, as you can see, this happened to form a binary pair. And so if you were to just take these two objects and put them in the Kuiper belt, they would remain binary for the lifetime of the solar system. And we see binaries all over the Kuiper belt. It's not a, an accident that Erikoth happens to be two small objects that lightly stuck together. If you apply solar pressure and other dynamical processes, you can actually take these two simulated objects and squeeze them together. And so this is how we think uh, things like Erikoth formed, but you can also produce binaries in the hierarchical formation case. You can also smash objects apart and recreate them together. So there's a lot of <laughs> detail we're trying to sort out here. And that's where my, my JWST program comes in. Um, in its simplest sense, we're actually just counting Kuiper belt objects. We want to know what we call the size distribution, which is the distribution of objects as a function of size. How many Plutos are there versus how many Erikoths are there? We know that these two numbers are, well, in fact, we know there are only two Pluto sized objects. Uh, I would love to see someone type the name of the other, if they can think of it, into the chat. Um, and then we know that there are roughly uh, 10 to the 5 or 100,000 Erikoths um, in in the Kuiper belt, but we'd like to actually go smaller than that. Erikoth is about 40 kilometers in size. We hope to get down uh, about a factor of five or six smaller than that. And so here is the, 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 the main theory plot that actually got us the time. Uh, what I'm plotting here is V band magnitude on, on the bottom axis. And so we're, we're all familiar with magnitudes. And of course the human eye can see sixth. Pluto sits at 19, um, and most of the Kuiper belt is in this blue curve here. Um, and then uh, the, the logarithm or the number of objects per square degree on the ecliptic. Um, I'm just sorry, I see someone chatting here. I, uh, I hope that I got the answer right. Um, and so there are two extrema models that are plotted here. Um, the orange line there that you see is a very simplified ver prediction of what you would expect from the hierarchical growth. And so, the, the reason why it's just a straight line there is because that's actually beyond the point where we no longer have information about Kuiper belt object numbers. Um, and so just drawn a straight line there and said, okay, if we then take JWST, this is how far, how faint we need to get to, to make an appreciable number of detections that are useful for our theorists. And so the red line there is the uh, anticipated depth we will get from JWST. The purple line is the faintest ever survey of Kuiper belt objects done previously, which happened to be done by Hubble. And that one was using 120 hours staring at one tiny little spot and looking for things that happened to move across. And they found two objects, <laughs> or three, excuse me, it was three objects. Um, so very, very expensive things. Now, if you then take the uh, 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 sort of expectations, early expectations of that other mode, the gravitational collapse mode, you expect on an opposite end of things, we sort of only maybe five or eight hyperbolic objects. And so in the simplest sense, that's what we're going to see, one or the other, and that just simply counting that number is going to be very powerful in knowing what uh, what planet formation was actually doing in the early stages of the solar system. Um, this is the camera we're going to use. This is NearCam. Uh, I believe that is the size of a large suitcase, essentially, and this is, of course, uh, in its frame that then gets attached to the back of the bus that JWST goes on. Um, I'm showing the filters here in the bottom because NearCam is really, really powerful from a uh, spectra and colors perspective. 
Um, but we're not, we're not doing any of that fancy stuff. We're literally just using the widest, most sensitive filter it can to give us as many bloody photons as we can collect in the shortest amount of time as possible. <laughs> and so we've got 45 hours on the program uh, and we're all going to be observing in the F150W2 filter, which is basically 1.5 microns, and then another one at about three microns. Um, the, the real workhorse for us is going to be that, that blue short wavelength filter there. Um, the program is actually really quite simple. We, we have found a spot on the ecliptic that we know is to be basically devoid of any bright galaxies or quasars or any of the other vermin that happen to get in the way of a project like this. <laughs> um, and we're going to take 10 spots on the sky and we're just going to observe those 10 spots and each one is going to get stared at and then we'll repeat and we'll repeat and we'll repeat and that will make one epoch. And then another month later, we'll do that again. And another month later, we'll do that again. And the idea is by observing these things months apart, we will also measure their orbits, not just their brightnesses. Um, the real trick of this is going to be in what I call shift and stuck. And I think this is why they brought me in is because this, this has been the thing that I've done since my thesis and you never leave your thesis behind. Um, the top frame, there are three images that I took from the Subaru telescope not so long ago, looking for Kuiper Belt objects. And I assure you, there's a Kuiper Belt object in there. Uh, you might be able to see it if I draw these red circles, but it would be not very convincing to, to, to see that detection from these three frames. However, we took a hundred frames. Um, and what we do is we try to do our best to subtract all of the stars and other things that get in the way. Um, and then we shift at, rates of motion that are consistent with Kuiper Belt objects, and we stack them. And when you get the right right, or even near right, you can see that the objects start to pop out again um, in, in the frames down here at the bottom. Um, and when you get it absolutely right, you see this nice round source. Um, and so this is how we go faint on things that move uh, compared to the stellar background. Um, and this is, of course, exactly what we're going to do with JWST. But that's not it. Um, God, this is the most selfish thing we've ever done. Uh, once we knew we were going to get the JWST time or felt like we were going to get it, we submitted to Hubble and we asked them if we could use HST to stare at the same spot at the same time. Uh, and they said yes, uh, which is ridiculous. Uh, I couldn't believe it. Um, now, to be fair, HST, uh, we, you've already seen what 100 hours of HST can do, right? I showed you that plot with the, the limiting magnitude there, and that's kind of what we expect uh, with the current performance. However, you know, 10, maybe if we see 35 uh, objects with JWST, 10 of those will be bright enough to be detectable, uh, immediately detectable by HST, and then we'll know the positions of all the others that we can try and go piece at where they are. And the reason why this is absolutely fantastic is because for the first time ever, we will actually be making parallax measurements in the Kuiper belt. And so normally when we take, uh, when we try to measure the orbit of an object, we are only given the at instantaneous position on the sky and its velocity. That's all we ever have. And we're always missing that third dimension. And so the only way we can actually evaluate the orbit normally is to track an object for months or years or decades, and then use Newtonian gravity to sort out what the orbit must be. And this is a, uh, needless to say, a very expensive thing to do. Um, we will actually be able to measure the positions of a lot of these objects just by using the fact that we have Hubble around the Earth and JWST around L2. Um, we were asked uh, to try and predict exactly what this would do for our orbits, but no one has ever done this before. And so we don't actually know yet. We don't. We don't even have that. We hadn't had the time to make the code that can handle these sorts of data. Uh, so this really is going to be a first. Um, and the other part of me that's really tickled is the fact that I'm also a compositions guy. I want to know what Kuiper belt objects are made of for various reasons. Um, we're going to get optical and near infrared colors of all of our detection, or at least all of the detections that are seen by both telescopes. Um, normally, you would have multiple separate programs at multiple separate times to go and do this. We're gonna get them all at once, which is, it's really gonna be fun. <laughs> um, and so in summary, uh, we are going to use JWST as a, just a simple fish finder, right? We're gonna go look and see what fish happened to, KBO fish happened to swim in front of our field of view. Uh, we expect to find objects as small as five kilometers, though uh, I should point out that we don't actually resolve any of these Kuiper belt objects. They're still individual pricks of light for us. Um, and so we have to assume what their albedos are, the albedo being how much, how shiny the surface is. Um, 
If the albedos are what we think they are, five kilometers should be about the, the limit, though some people are suggesting now that that might actually be closer to one because there appears to be some information from Erikoff that we're getting now, uh, which will apply to this program. We will also be able to get uh, parallaxes with H HST, which is just absolutely bonkers. Um, and of course the answer to what we're trying to do with all of this is to try and figure out which of these two modes was the main one that uh, drove planet formation. Um, with that, I'll take questions. Wow, very, very interesting. Um, so we've got, uh, looks like some hierarchical or uh, direct formation for both uh, black holes and planets happening. Uh, yeah, similar things, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so we have one question from, um, I believe, David Payne. Um, he asks, um, would the many body gravity field act like a viscous fluid, allowing the application of fluid mechanics to planet formation? Uh, that's um, actually a really interesting thought. Um, the, to call it a fluid wouldn't be truly fair. There's just not enough material there to, to do that, uh, even in the early stages of, of planet formation at Kuiper belt distances, because we just don't think there was enough uh, gas and stuff around, but much closer to the sun. Yeah, definitely. Um, depending on what the temperatures were and things, there could be states where the disc actually does act like a fluid and back reacts on planets. And so I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this term called uh, planet migration. Um, but if you imagine embedding, uh, I don't know, say a Jupiter sized planet inside a, a, a gaseous disc, there is essentially a, a viscofluid reaction that will move the planet around. And this is possibly one of the reasons why we see so many hot Jupiters, because yeah. the gas pushed the planet inwards. Is that distinct from like gravitational drag? Um, uh, it is a distinct force. Okay. So gravitational drag actually is one of the reasons why people started looking for um, alternative routes to hierarchical growth, because when you get to around a couple meters in size, dust to pebbles, to rocks, to boulders, mm -hmm. those boulders then start to interact with the gas that we we know has to have existed and very quickly spiral into the sun. And so you have to do, it's called the one meter barrier and one meter isn't necessarily accurate. The, the size depends on where you are in the solar system. Uh, but regardless, there is a barrier at a, a preferential size at which objects will interact with the gas and no longer be decoupled from it. Um, and that becomes a very big problem for certain types of planet formation, hierarchical growth being one of them. Okay. Um, although I understand that um, that gravitational drag might be helpful for hierarchical growth of uh, supermassive black holes. Um, uh, perhaps Madeline can comment on that. Um, if uh, I know, um, I think uh, Dr. Pritchett at UVic has floated the idea that um, uh, like these black holes might um, spiral in uh, in the galaxy uh, to merge with the uh, supermassive black hole at the center. That might be one factor influencing their growth. Um, okay. Uh, second, we've got um, the, what's the answer to your uh, question you had for all of us? It's, what's it's the other? Eris. Eris is Eris. the correct answer. Yeah. All right. And so... Within a thousand kilometers, the same size, or within, within a hundred kilometers, the same diameter as Pluto. Excellent. So I think Calvin won that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got it. <laughs> um, and then uh, Reg asks, uh, what's the field of view of the James W. Uh, James Webb Space Telescope compared to Hubble? Good question. Um, every camera is different. <laughs> um, I just Googled it. Why? Because <laughs> I can't remember either. They're actually very, very similar. Okay. Um, so near cam which is the camera on um or the near infrared camera on jwst there are two 2.2 by 2.2 arc minute areas so but they're separate they're two separate 2.2 squares whereas right. with hubble so um that's they give it in arc seconds so it's about two as well um but okay. obviously there's only one of those so really you're getting double but the problem is when you observe something, so say I want to observe my quasars, I don't care about a disjoint field of view that has a big gap for over yeah. there. <laughs> it's very difficult to plan your observations because of this weird, it's like a very elongated rectangle shape with a gap in the middle. So you've got two different squares. So effectively they're, they're about the same field of view. Kind yeah. of you get double for the price of one, but how yeah. useful that is 
because it is unclear. Yeah, well, so we're, we are taking it. advantage of that to mm -hmm. turn the two detectors sideways and then move the telescope in the direction that Kuiper Belt objects would naturally want to move on the sky. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be nice if that gap were gone, then we wouldn't have to worry about orientation problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that why on your on your first slide there were like sort of two um, sets it. of squares? Yeah, there's actually there. So each one of those squares uh, uh, represents an individual pointing. So we have 10 pointings in a, a field and then you see the pair. So there's five and then another five because we move along and then we move along again. And you can just see the orient the, the outline of the detector in all of those rectangles. Gotcha. Um, and so there were sort of two sets of two squares going like this. Is yeah. that gap in the middle of the gap in the detector? Or is yeah, like that's right. So you see the gap twice for our, because uh, we have two rows of, of pointings. <laughs> right. So the, um, the gap is wider than the fields of view, or is it? No, it's not. Uh, that probably okay. was just a, an impression given by the plot. <laughs> okay, so, sorry. So like the top row is is both detectors, and then the bottom row is both exactly. Detectors. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, looks like Lori has a question as well. Oh shoot. Yes. Uh, yes, Wes. I was wondering if you could um, switch over to the to the uh, slide. Where you had um, uh, the things that you took that you took originally, and then there were five little ones with all the, the nice little. Nice little uh, I'll share, things. and then you uh, can guide me to which okay. slide you're Keep talking going. about. Oops, I can go back. Uh, right one. there. That's what I, the shift in the shift in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, could you tell me about? I, and I, I just because I don't know. Uh, the you've got one point five. All the way to three um, ah, sorry, per I hour. Have said that. Yeah, this um, is arc seconds per hour. Yeah. Okay. So what's happening there? And is like are some like so the one that's at two is that the one that you want? So because uh, it's nice. Because Kuiper belt objects are at a range of distances, as you saw from that animation that I showed, yeah. each one moves at its own unique rate of motion that that depends on the location of the object, the location of the Earth, the time of year so on and so forth. Um, and so as an object moves, we know that uh, they typically move between one and five arc seconds per hour. Okay. And so when we're doing this search, we will produce a grid of different stacks corresponding to different rates of motion and different angles of motion on the sky. And then I have some machine learning algorithms that do a lot of that sorting for us with some final human vetting to you know, avoid going blind. Um, and so what you're looking at here is one of the objects that has actually been discovered by that process. And it just happens to be at about 48 AU, which at the time of observation corresponds to about 2.2 arc seconds per hour, which is okay. nominal for this object. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. So, and the only, only other question I want is, um, uh, is there any way that we could get that animation at the beginning of your of sure. the, I think that would be wonderful. We could, we <laughs> could use, I'd love to use it with our programs because that we talk about, be my pleasure. you know, what's the thing, okay, yeah. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> okay, uh, Thank absolutely, you. thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, I don't think I see any other questions coming up in the chat. Calvin, do we have any questions from YouTube? Nope, none here. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both very, very much. Those were uh, fa fascinating talks. Great to hear the update about uh, James W. Uh, yeah, I keep saying James W. James <laughs> Webb Space Telescope. Um, and uh, we'll all be crossing our fingers for the launch yeah. Uh, yeah. going swimmingly and uh, for both of you to get some excellent uh, results. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Next up, um, we've got a brief uh, uh, look at the winter solstice, which is coming up in just a couple days here um, from one of our board members, uh, Patricia. Uh, we'll be talking a bit about the cultural significance about the solstice through the ages. Patricia, can you hear? Are you here? I thought I just saw her. The video isn't up yet. Uh, Patricia, your video is not up. And you're muted. Yeah, excellent. Mute. There we are. Hi. Hello, Patricia. Hello. <laughs> um, and I so, think Calvin's bringing up your. Yep, I've got the slides for you. Fantastic. So okay, great. Help you out there. 
Yeah, so Patricia is one of the board members for the Friends of the DAO and uh, she put together this uh, short presentation for us. All right, while well, this is loading, uh, here we go. Um, <laughs> I have a, a short poem, A Christmas Carol by Christina Rossetti. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. In the weak midwinter, frosty winds may moan. The earth stood still, hard as iron. Water like a stone house had fallen. Snow on snow, snow on snow. In the bleak midwinter, long ago. Or as Shakespeare in Richard III wrote, now is the winter of our discontent. So the winter solstice is actually going to start on December 21st. And it, it, the sun rises at 8.02 a.m. and it will set at 4.21 p.m. So we only have roughly eight hours of light, but at least we have light. As you all know, the winter solstice signifies the astronomical beginning of the coldest, darkest, wet, wettest, and most freezing of our four seasons. You can um, put the first slide on, Calvin. It was a time of great anxiety as people gathered their harvests, slaughtered their animals. They didn't want to feed over the winter and then preserve them and prepared for times of starvation. In the northernmost parts of the planet, people experience darkness 24 hours a day, like in the Arctic. It really should not be a surprise that this is when fire provided warmth and defense from animals and uh, the deep, deep cold, and that monsters were born in mythology. Some Wiccans welcome the new year with light, including candles and yule logs. The pagans celebrated the rebirth of the sun god as days were filled with more light. This lasted for 12 days after the solstice, thus the 12 days of Christmas. In Scandinavia, the Feast of Jewel occurred when fires were lit to symbolize the heat, light, and life-giving properties of the sun. A piece of the log was saved and used for the next year. The ashes were cultivated and strewn on fields as fertilizers every night until the 12th night, or kept as a charm or medicine. French peasants believe that if ashes were kept under their bed, it would protect their house against thunder and lightning. All right, next slide, please. These are pictographs of the sun from various cultures throughout the, the earth. The first recorded sun worship was in Egypt, 14, thousand years ago um, and the other and the um their sun god was called Ra and in India Europe Egypt Persia Mesoamerica they all had religions built around the idea of the sun god who ruled the upper and lower worlds and visited them daily the sun was thought to embody justice and wisdom as well as the reason for life on earth in India Surat is worshipped as an all-seeing God who sees both good and evil actions as he expels evil dreams, disease, and darkness. Mithra was the angel of divinity in the Zoroastrian religion of Iran, and the Romans adapted their image of Mithra and created a sophisticated religion. They had seven levels of initiation and shared communal meals. They met in underground rooms which still survive. They had secret rituals and reluctant to share information. The art of the period shows Mithra sharing a banquet with the sun. <clears throat> the feast of Sol and Victus, or the unconquered sun, was on December 25th. But the Christians liked that date so much that they stole it and made it into Christmas. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? This lovely lady is Gryla. And she was a monster created by the mythology of Iceland. <clears throat> now, she, um, she was um, apparently a creature with 13 tails and hooves, and she liked to kidnap children. Um, and can you go to the next slide? 
um, <clears throat> she would cook and eat the children. And she had a, a, a pet cat that liked to hunt and eat children as well. The next slide, please. And then um, the cat just hunted all people regarded of their behavior. And this is the Yule lads. And they were as ugly as it could possibly make them. They had large noses to sniff out food. They visited children at night for 13 days leading up to Christmas. And they stole food candles and lanterns and did their best to terrify children. However, the Icelandic people felt that it was so, so disturbing to children that they banned the whole idea in 1946. Next slide, please. So they turned the Yule lads and their family into something different. And this is Santa Claus. So um, he was derived from the idea of Saint Nick, which is celebrated on December 6th all over Europe. And elves are believed to be real by 54% of all Icelanders. And they actually have a formal study of the mythology and history of elves. Um, now there's also a Russian Santa Claus who's called Grandfather Frost who carried a big stick and snow followed him wherever he went. He's either a dwarf or an orc. He would bring presents in a troika pulled by three horses accompanied by his granddaughter and an evergreen tree. He was kind to honest, hardworking folks and evil to the lazy. However, after the Russian revolution, he disappeared and uh, he made a comeback 20 years ago. Next slide, please. And this is kind of an unusual thing. In Norway, the brooms were hidden on Christmas Eve so that witches wouldn't come and steal them and ride away. And that's all I know about that one. So the next one is pomegranates. And this is a big theme of winter solstice. There is some kind of feasting in every country on earth. And in the Zoroastrian religion, um, they eat pomegranates, watermelon, pistachios, and actually more different kinds of food all night to keep away evil spirits. They feel that pomegranates especially make the heart stronger so that uh, people can survive the winter. All right, and then I think we're on to part two. <laughs> right, sorry, these are a little bit more amateurish and just learning how to do all this stuff. They look great. So, <laughs> so that actually the lanterns to the left, or yeah, my left, your, your left too. Um, that's from the Vancouver Lantern Festival. So next slide, please. All right, in Czechoslovakia, women who were single would throw their shoes at the front door to see how they would land. If the shoe landed with the heel facing the house, the woman could expect to be remain single for the rest of her life, or at least that year. <clears throat> right, next one. And this is a picture of Stonehenge and, Nor and Newgrange also in Ireland are two big winter solstice celebrations in um, both Ireland and England. Um, in Stonehenge, they, it's lined up to sunrise. So uh, people will stay up all night seeing the sunset and the sunrise in the morning. And at Newgrange, the um, passage of the sun is illuminated in a, a special passage for 17 minutes. And it's, the passage is 19 meters long and it extends into a chamber and access is only by lottery from December 18th to 23rd. So in Ireland right now, the sunrise is at 8.58 a.m. Okay, next slide, please. And this is a picture of glutinous rice balls. Dongji is a Chinese festival for the winter solstice. And the purpose is to balance yin and yang. It's uh, thought to be more important than the Chinese New Year. And actually the Vancouver Lantern Festival was derived from this. Uh, people feast on dumplings, glutinous rice balls pictured here and rib soup with daikon. 
The ancestors are honored with candles, incense, and prayers. The food they eat is supposed to build resistance to the cold. Next slide. All right, this is a picture of Saint Lucia. She was the saint of virgins and the blind. She um, has a very tragic story, which I guess is why she's a saint. She fought for the Christians during Roman times and she um, would feed the Christians in the catacombs and wear a wreath with candles in it. So she would have her, her hands free so she could carry as much food as possible. But unfortunately, uh, there was a young man who was interested in her and he thought she had absolutely beautiful eyes, but she didn't want to marry anybody. So she gouged out her eyes, thus her affinity to blind people. But he ratted her out to the Romans and um, they executed her. And um, in, in all over Scandinavia and Italy, on the 13th of December, she celebrated and um, the way they do it in Sweden, from what I understand is that young girls wear white gowns with a red sash and a wreath with candles and they serve their families coffee, saffron buns and cinnamon cookies in the morning. And I think there's choirs and other things that are going on, but I've never been there in Sweden. So um, that's all I know about it. So can you go to the next slide? And there's a picture of a young girl wearing the wreath with candles. And the next slide. All right, and the last thing is mistletoe. One of the big things about the winter solstice is people venerating plants that are always green. And mistletoe is actually um, a rather parasitic plant, um, but it does produce its own chlorophyll. And the white berries are thought to be symbols of fertility and in Victorian times, when people were kissing under the mistletoe, every time a man kissed a woman, he would eat one of the berries. But the men started dying off and they realized that the berries are actually poison. Although it's considered to be a symbol of peace and love and understanding. And it was a very important plant to the Druids. A priest used it for five days after the new moon following the winter solstice. And they would cut the mistletoe from a holy oak tree with a golden sickle. And they, the branches could never touch the ground. And then they were divided and distributed to people who hung the branches above their doorways as protection against evil witchcraft. They believe it could cure illnesses, be an antidote to poisons and ensure fertility. It was also a sign of peace and goodwill. The Christians in the early days banned it because they didn't want anything to do with the Druids at all. And then lastly, there's a wonderful TED talk about the myth of Baldar and the mistletoe. And I'm not going to um, take a lot of time and, and tell you the whole story. It's on Google if you want to see it. It's a wonderful animated story, but roughly speaking, um, Loki was uh, jealous of his brother Baldor, who was the king of love and peace and everybody loved him. And he found out when his mother was worried about Baldor having dreams that he was going to die, she went all over the um, nine kingdoms there and tried very hard to make sure that nothing could harm her son. But Loki dressed up as an old woman and found out her secret and he got a piece of mistletoe because that was the one thing she had neglected because she thought it was just a silly weed, gave it to her blind son, Haldor, and helped him make it into an arrow and pierced the chest of Baldor who died. And the rest of the story is about how the um, other gods really tried to resurrect him and imprison Loki for his terrible crime. And after that, Queen Frigg decided that mistletoe should be a sign of peace and love and understanding. And that's the way it is for today. So I wish everybody a, a wonderful holiday and love and peace to all. Thanks very much, cool. Patricia. You're welcome. Uh, Aaron, can I yes. add, add something just uh, quickly? 
Sure. Yeah. So uh, first off, I thought that was really fascinating, Patricia, but this is actually more to do with the previous talk. And I just checked with Dave Bale on, uh, cause I, something in, uh, in the talk twigged with me and he actually uses the Plaskett telescope and the NeoSat orbiting uh, satellite Canada operates to triangulate positions of near earth objects. So he will use those simultaneously to determine, uh, to, to quickly get the orbital parameters of near earth objects. So just thought that, that was, uh, uh, might be of interest to everybody. Yeah, so when I said the the uh, parallaxes that we're doing are a first, it's a, I meant specifically for Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, near oh, yeah. Earth yeah. stuff has been done for a number of years now, and it's actually going to be that work that we're going to piggyback off of because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> it yeah. just happens yeah. to be that they will be heliocentric orbits versus geocentric uh, sort of thing. Yeah, but yeah, no. I just thought I'd give a shout out to right. Dave. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Don. Okay, next up we have uh, Ask, an, Ask an Astronomer. So um, we've got uh, Ruhi uh, here from UVic. She's an astronomy student in her fourth year. Um, and uh, I'll be helping her out with that one. And then we've got uh, Amy Archer, who's been uh, collecting some questions for us. Hi. So first, I would um, just ask that if anybody has any questions about anything, um, you can put them either in the chat window in YouTube, or you can put them in the Zoom chat window, and we'll be monitoring the questions and passing them on um, <laughs> to be answered, hopefully. <laughs> so um, uh, just to say there's so much exciting space news happening right now. It's so cool. Um, <laughs> So we've talked a bit about James Webb. So I'm going to flip and go to the sun for a bit and, talk, and ask some questions about the Parker Solar Probe. Um, so uh, first question <laughs> is what will the Parker Solar Probe be able to answer for us? What's the... Aaron, you want to take this one? I, I uh... don't know much about this one, Chris. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The other astronomers on the on the Zoom are welcome to you know jump in as well if they. <laughs> um, so I was just doing some reading about the Parker Solar Probe before we started here, and uh, yeah, it looks like in a lot of ways we're sort of um, just dipping our toes into the solar atmosphere and figuring out what's there. Um, the sun is as bright as it is; it's really really hard to observe because it's so bright, um, it, any small fluctuations um, and things like the extended solar atmosphere are very, very difficult to see um, when you've got that enormous ball of light uh, also staring you in the same direction. Um, and so there are structures in the uh, solar atmosphere that we usually only get to see during things like eclipses, um, such as uh, coronal streamers. If any of you have seen the image of the um, recent solar eclipse from 2017 with those beautiful almost like wing shapes coming out from the sun in either direction. Uh, those are these uh, coronal streamers. And we know they're there, but we don't really know much about how they form or how they interact with each other um, and with processes that happen on the sun's surface. Um, the sun's magnetic field uh, and the turbulence um, near the surface seems to interact a whole bunch with the outer solar atmosphere, but we're still piecing together a lot of those mechanisms. Um, and actually on its way to the sun, the Parker Solar Probe made a discovery about something that we didn't really know about, um, something called uh, switchbacks in the sun's magnetic field. Um, so uh, the sun has what's called a, a solar wind, these particles streaming off from it in all directions. Uh, but the, so that solar wind fluctuates and it's carried around by the sun's magnetic field. Um, and we're not really sure what drives a lot of it. Um, and as the Parker Solar Probe was heading in towards the sun, it was tracking those magnetic field lines, and most of them sort of stream out from the sun's surface, but it discovered little kinks, like S-shaped curves in these, um, in these magnetic field lines, um, and we'd seen hints of something like that before, but never, never a direct detection, um, 
And now as the solar, as a Parker solar probe gets closer and closer to the sun, scientists have a whole bunch of ideas of how these kinks form and how exactly they drive or are driven by the solar wind. Um, and uh, there were, I think, five different uh, theories and we're trying to piece together which one is which based on new data coming in. Uh, one of the things that we still don't know about the sun is why the corona is uh, eight to 10 times hotter than the surface of the sun itself. It's a very strange thing, right? Normally things mm -hmm. get cooler the further you go away from the heat source, but this is quite the opposite. And there's been lots of ideas over the years to explain uh, what that heat heating process must be. Uh, but unfortunately, unlike the lab, we can't really put a ruler down uh, and, and take in situ measurements of the corona to really figure out what the conditions of the corona actually are, except now we have a probe, uh, a fantastic piece of technology. <laughs> and we're just going to hopefully be able to start to put that together. It's amazing to me that, you know, this fact has been known for 150 years, how hot the corona actually is, and we've not been able to figure out why. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that really does come down a lot to just being able to get close to the sun and in its atmosphere so that we can sort of look out and sideways away from the sun while still looking through that solar atmosphere. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's a lot of what this Parker Solar Probe is doing, just by getting close enough uh, that we're looking not at the sun, but through the atmosphere, we can get a lot more contrast and a lot better measurements than uh, trying to stare very, very, very close to the sun in the sky. Um... Thank you. So for in case people just don't know, because often with some of these sorts of um, things, we hear about it once we're getting feed, we're getting data back, right? So when was this, when was the, the probe launched? Uh, um, I, uh, the probe was actually launched in 2018. So I, uh, Aaron, do you think you'd be able to bring up that yeah, I can image? Pull it up. Thank Let me you. Just grab it here. Real quick. I will share screen. You go ahead. Gorgeous. Um, so yes, yeah, so the probe was actually launched in 2018. And so just recently it's made its first passage into the corona. So if you can see it uh in 2021, first passage into the corona. So that's about where we are right now. But that is not the end of um our probe's lifetime into the sun. It'll manage to get to its closest final approach in 2025. Um and then hopefully we'll be able to learn a lot from it in these next four years. There's still a lot we can learn, so it's gonna be really exciting. Yeah. You wanna show that video that I just linked there? Yeah, I'm, I think I have that one. Uh, Let's see. Fantastic. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so this is a video um, taken of images from the Parker Solar Probe on its latest close approach or perihelion um, to the sun and those, um, let's see, those uh, streaks you see oop, that are sort of bouncing all over the screen, uh, those I believe are individual particles from the solar wind hitting the detectors. Whereas the sort of um, haze you see streaming from side to side, that is the solar corona, the solar wind. Oh gosh, my cats keep knocking down my light. <laughs> um, the other cool thing you can see in here is uh, some planets. So that's these, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, that's these bright spots. So I believe that's Mercury, or sorry, that one's Mercury. Venus was the first one. And I believe we have um, Earth and Mars and then Jupiter was the far one, if I remember correctly. Uh, but yeah, you can see like this thing is just whipping around the sun and you can really get a sense of the different distances of the planets too. Um, by how uh, Parker's view changes. Is that the Milky Way that you're seeing as well? Uh, so the Milky Way sure is, is yeah. that Beautiful. right here. That's yeah. gorgeous. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron, do you think you'd be able to slow down the, the video by chance? Uh, let me see. I don't if know I if YouTube lets you do speed. that anymore. Can you change the playback speed? Playback speed right there. Yeah. yeah. Got to just move on my Zoom. <laughs> windows out of the way. Oh, come on. Normal. Let's go to quarter speed. Awesome. 
Yeah, there we go. So I think, yeah, that's Venus, Mercury, Milky Way. Um, and then I think, yeah, Mars, Earth, and maybe Jupiter. Could just be a bright oh. star. It's hard to tell. Um, and are these switchbacks that they found those little S shape um, so no, trajectories? The, those little trajectories, those are individual like protons and stuff hitting the um, okay. hitting the Parker Solar Probe, I believe. Uh, they're, they're very energetic and leave traces along the detector. Mm -hmm. It's really awesome to see that Milky Way kind of just like rotate into view. Isn't it? Uh, it's incredible. Yeah. And um, if you watch, you can see that the speed of the background changes. And this is because the Parker Solar Probe is in a super elliptical orbit. It swings very, very close to the sun really, really fast and then swings right back away and slows down. Uh, and this is important because we don't want it to spend too close to the sun um, for too long, because even though it's very well shielded, uh, it does heat up quite a bit on each, uh, each close approach. And so it takes um, a couple months after each quick flyby to, uh, to cool off and adjust its orbit. I think it's actually, uh, its elliptical orbit takes it out to either Mercury or Venus, and it does a, a, a gravitational assist on each pass. Um, to slow down its orbit and drop it closer and closer to the sun's surface on each pass. So does, cool. does anybody know if there's work being done here in Victoria on any of this? Do we, do we have anybody doing any solar work? I don't think so. No, we're all farther out, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, okay. It's too cloudy here. Yeah. <laughs> So I think you've just answered the, the, the third part of my question, which is what will happen once this passes through the sun, but it's not going to go right through the sun. It's going to burn up. Yeah, I think eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just going to keep going. <laughs> and we're going to use it until the very end. Exactly. Yeah. And I think uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think this is the first, uh, spacecraft we've actually managed to send into the sun. Um, there was mention of an, another probe that I wasn't actually aware of that uh, a couple decades ago went above the pole of the sun. Well, um, that was U Ulysses, right? Ulysses, yeah. I'm not sure if that did a deorbit into the sun, but uh, like there are very, very few spacecraft that we've actually deorbited into the sun because it's actually very hard to do. Um, like it actually took a lot more um, energy, I believe, for the Parker Solar Probe to make it to as close as it is to the sun than it did to get new horizons out of the solar system. Oh. Yeah, because um, in order, like the escape velocity of the solar system is not that much greater um, than the Earth's velocity um, at, at our sort of location around the sun. You have to add like maybe 50% or so. Um, Wes or, or um, uh, mm -hmm. Madeline can uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, it's not a, uh, it's significant, but it's not a huge, huge difference. To get something into the sun, you have to do a hundred percent because you have to essentially stop mm -hmm. it sideways motion. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the, the numbers to, the if, if these mean anything to the earth, it, orbital velocity is about 26 kilometers a second and Mercury's is about 70. It's slightly shy of 70. And so the energy, just to get to Mercury, the energy balance is uh, astronomical, pun intended. Uh, yeah. And then the, the repeated flybys of Mercury for the gravity assist is the only reason why they can get down to the surface or well, into the corona of the sun. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially the, the spacecraft is shedding a bit of its orbital energy onto Mercury uh, every time it does a pass. And so Mercury is actually uh, very, 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 very minutely further away from the sun than it was when, when we launched the Parker Space Probe. Sure. That's so funny. Um, thank you. Okay, next question is actually for Wes and Madeline. <laughs> and um, the question is, how long do you think you'll be working on the data you hope to get from the JWST? 
Uh, my search will take uh, a year, probably. It's our sort of anticipated uh, bit, but we, <laughs> we're hoping to do more than one program, of course. Um, uh, and so I guess the answer is probably going to depend on how long JWST lasts. Uh, so take that number and add one. <laughs> How long does it take to build the data pipeline? How long do, uh, how many grad students can you recruit? To... Yeah. Be hiring in September. <laughs> yeah, I guess it really depends on how quickly everything gets done. Um, especially for, for this, I guess, exciting discovery work. Like a lot of people are interested in seeing the host galaxies in these quasars. And so there's a little bit of competition. <laughs> So we don't want to be too slow if we can avoid it. <laughs> but at the same time, realistically, it could take us a year. But I mean, mm -hmm. hopefully we could get some basic results out in a few months. It really, it, with the PSF subtraction, it, it really depends on what the data actually looks like from the telescope. It could be good or it could be very painful. <laughs> um, and then once we do that, so we're only observing two quasars. And in terms of population statistics, you can't really say much about black holes generally with two quasars. And so this is really a pilot program. So that's how we sold it in our <laughs> proposal is we've never seen these before. Can JWST do it? And then once we hopefully prove that we can, then we would say, okay, we've proven it. This is great. Can we now have more, please? <laughs> so, yeah, it depends how it goes. But hopefully we would be using it, especially because this is the only instrument that can do the job uh, now. And I don't think there's anything planned for the near future. So we try and do as much with web as we can for the five to ten years that it will be online. Yeah. Please, oh, Master, can I have some more? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly <laughs> please. <laughs> So it's only supposed to last for five to 10 years. Yeah. But Hubble has outlived itself by a long shot, right? So yeah. 20 so I think years, the, five years to you. Seems I think the fairer comparison is the WISE spacecraft. Um, so this is an, a spacecraft that was in Earth orbit uh, using similar wavelengths as, as JWST to find basically asteroids and that sort of thing. Um, and it requires coolant to keep a, a spacecraft that cold. And the same is true of JWST. And so we have a nominal five or so year expectancy for the duration of that coolant before we run out. Um, and there's already been talk about how that can be pushed along to seven or so years. And so depending on who you talk to in, inside NASA or STSCI, it's five to seven years. Um, if we're lucky, it'll last longer. If we're unlucky, it won't even be that. Uh, but I get the feeling that likewise, uh, oh, that's weird, likewise, uh, <laughs> once the coolant runs out, we will figure out how to use it in a uh, less than optimal way. And so WISE is still up there and it's still actually observing well, well, well past uh, its nominal run out coolant time. Um, hopefully we can do the same thing with JWST. That's yeah, really so just... interesting. And I think I've had it, I, I've thought something different to you. So I don't know which one of us is right. Yeah, yeah. Come back <laughs> in five or seven years. Yeah. <laughs> I, I heard that I think I thought all of the instrument was passively cooled by the sun shield, except I thought Miri oh, had totally to have wrong. A, That's interesting. <laughs> I think, look, it, one of us is right. <laughs> one of us, that's okay. <laughs> this is how science works. <laughs> yeah. So... The way that I thought it happened was that so that that sun shield, it blocks out the heat from the earth and the sun. And so it's passively cooled. So the limiting factor correct. is the fuel. Yeah, you so are correct. It needs fuel to turn around and point at what we want to point at. And it needs fuel to keep it in that L2 orbit. So every so often it needs to get corrected. Also, one big factor in the five to 10 year window is how much fuel will it need from launch to get to where it's going? So if launch is absolutely perfect, hopefully it won't need much fuel. And so it can then use all of that fuel for the observations later on. But if the launch really depends on how it gets inserted into its orbit, but if it's off a little bit, they'll have to use a bit more fuel. And so I think that's kind of where that window comes in, but it's the fuel that will run out. So we won't be able to point it anywhere anymore. 
Yes, you are. You are correct. Yeah. Totally so wrong. it's yes. Yeah, so the coolant's <laughs> great because we actually won't run out of it like has happened before, but the fuel will. So I think one of the main reasons that Hubble lasted so long is because we could go and replace it and and fix it with all of the things that are needed. But with Web, we can't do that. So. <laughs> Yeah, if it, yeah, if the launch goes really well in terms of fuel consumption, they're also very careful in terms of movers about like which like changing filters and and moving to do things which like trying to optimize um, like fuel consumption. So maybe it's not as good for our observations to do things this way, but for fuel it's better. So I think they're very aware of what will cost so much just to try and push that lifetime out. But yeah, I think everyone's pretty optimistic about that it'll more likely be the 10 years, but you've got to build a definite and it will definitely make it to five. So since James Webb has been 20 years in the making, and we think it might last five to 10 years, that means somebody's already working on the, the next one, right? Yeah. yeah. It's still pretty early days, but yes. Right. <laughs> Hopefully it's about halfway there. <laughs> yeah, if you want to <laughs> look it up, uh, if you want to look it up, it's called, Lu the concept is called LUVOIR, L-U-V-O-I-R. And it's a, it's a JWST on steroids is what it mm -hmm. is. Uh, it's a 12, the concept is about a 12 meter mirror in exactly the same sort of configuration as JWST, but operating at UV optical and short near IR wavelengths where you know, coolant and sun shields is not super critical. Um, and if this works, if JWST works, then that's probably next on the list. It's the highest priority for the American uh, astronomy community to, in terms of future space-based mission things. So uh, yeah. there's yeah. some real development going on there. But that's like 2040s, hope maybe at the earliest, probably. So yeah, so, there'll be a while that James Webb is up and working and then stops and then we'll be waiting for the next one. Whereas we were very lucky that Hubble lasted to the point where now we have both of them together, but that's very, very- It wasn't the plan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, oh. I'm just gonna bring up a, an image of uh, the Louvoir concept. Um, so yeah, it really yeah, is exactly. the James W. WST <laughs> on uh, steroids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, I also want to show um, up here how they've wrapped <laughs> the mirrors around the central body of the telescope. Um, so where JWST had just like the two sides folded back, this one has several um, sets of mirrors sort of rolled backwards. Uh, and I'm wondering like, are these like things just going to get more and more wrapped up? Like, are we going to have like, <laughs> big um, uh, plastic wrap telescopes out there eventually like yeah I wonder if you just send up all of the mirrors separately and then there's astronauts up there that just assemble them yeah <laughs> maybe you just have a, yeah, a telescope oh, crazy, building facility on the moon or something <laughs> yeah this looks so advanced oh my it God. Yeah, the pointing yeah. like look, look yeah. at this but this one won't use fuel for the thrusters is that what um, so I, JWST will, I, but, I but this, um, the Luvar won't, I think I, it will I, have to, if it's, yeah, because it's pretty it's fancy. Got a sunshade, then it's probably out at L2. Yeah. Mm. So the there's fuel, a great the deal of needed. development that will be done before the, <laughs> it's, you know, the word is concept. You see concept cars all the time yeah. and they never quite make it to production. Same mm -hmm. sort of thing here where there's going to be a lot going on before anything like this, mm -hmm. a lot of design changes before anything like this would ever come to fruition. Yeah. Um, so another question about the James Webb, um, my video here, sorry. is, is there, is the thought that there's going to be, um, a JWST deep field for after the, um, fuel runs out? Is that what the next life for it is going to be? I, so part of the fuel use is keeping it in the L2 orbit. And so I guess it, it would depend on where it ran out, but because that L2 is somewhat unstable, so it could fly off and <laughs> be gone. I don't know. I don't I don't think we'd potentially be lucky enough to it for it to point in one spot. I don't know. It's a good yeah. question. 
does it use gyroscopes for pointing or is it really just the fuel? Pretty sure it has to. Uh, I, think yeah. it, I think it's the only thing that gyros are the only thing that keep things stable enough to point. So okay. precisely. Um, so I was just, one. oh yeah, no, if it was about that one, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so, um, the the giant solar shield on the, on the Louvoir uh, uh, sort of begs the question like, on sort of the hairy edge of, of when you're running out of fuel, do you think the sunshade could be used as a bit of like a solar sail for the JWST to help station keep? Well, so it's it funny you say that. Uh, the first thing, one of the first things that gets unfolded at the back of JWST is a, a back reaction panel um, because the solar sail does get pushed on by the sun. And so there's a panel, essentially a, a jib sail that, that pushes back and keeps helps stabilize uh, and removes the need for most of the fuel to prevent that from being a problem. It's a pretty clever design. That's cool. So, so that'll help keep it like oriented rather than? Uh... Yeah, it helps prevent, it helps minimize the influence of the solar radiation in momentum interference as in turning the telescope or pushing it away from the, the orbit that you want it to be in. Awesome. The next telescope to go up, or one of the next big ones to go up, is this is the Nancy Roman Space Telescope. Is that right? So is that designed like JWST, or is it a bit of a different design? No one knows. Uh, I, I know it's a single <laughs> monolithic mirror. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I think the concept was born out of the spare uh, two meter Hubble size mirrors that um, the CIA gave to NASA. Um, I, I think that's actually where it came from. Certainly that those, those mirrors do exist. Um, and so, you know, it's really interesting. Astronomy has a tendency to build a tool that can look very deeply in a new big mirror, CAC, JWST, whatever. And it then points at individual spots and takes individual pictures. And then the next thing we do is build the next big thing to point in individual places while simultaneously building the smaller one that can do what the previous version was doing, but for the whole bloody sky um, or something like it. And so that's really what the Nancy Roman uh, telescope reflects is an advancement in camera technology that can then do large swaths of the sky that Hubble never had a chance to do. Yeah, so apparently it's a hundred times larger the field of view of Roman compared to Hubble. So you can see a lot at once. So I guess yeah. that's the, it's good to survey telescope in terms yeah, of- Yeah, exactly getting a lot of data for astronomers generally, whereas Webb is a targeted, who wants this? And <laughs> we all fight over it. <laughs> hey, one last question from um, one of our younger uh, viewers. So I'm just gonna squeeze it in. <laughs> um, so the question is, um, what was the first ever rover and or, and or telescope to be sent into space and what happened to it? Ooh. Oh, it would have been the first one. That's a darn good question. I think the first, I can tell you the first rover that hit Mars, that was the Pathfinder yeah. rover, I think. And then I don't know if any were sent we go to Venus Mars first. first? We didn't send anything to the moon. I think we Surely didn't we would have meant to the moon. Yeah, that's what but I there, there was, I'm trying to remember if I looked at, um, looked at some, um, early moon vehicles and I can't remember if it actually was deployed but it was like a it was a moon v like a robot on like skids that was supposed to kind of like uh, step forward and it had a tether to its lander or something and um, I can't remember is that the one that Chris Gaynor's oh yeah maybe Chris is saying it in chat and perhaps... yeah Don Don suggests oh, uh, the Russian Lunacod um, yeah. oh yeah sorry that's Chris as well. Yeah, yeah they, used to, uh, they used to steer them in real time too, if I recall correctly. Chris can confirm that. I mean, that makes sense. It's pretty close. Um, so, so yeah, it looks like it was e even earlier than the lunar path or than the Mars Pathfinder. Um, I heard. I think I heard recently, and I could be misremembering this, <laughs> but I thought that one of these lunar probes or, or rovers was actually on the moon doing science at the same time that the astronauts landed on the moon, which is really cool. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah. So don't know 
how to fact check that, but that's <laughs> what I heard. Uh, <laughs> you'd be thinking of a uh, surveyor and the astronauts actually went and, and visited it and brought a piece back. Really? Oh. Wow. And I was alive when that happened. So what, that they just like broke away. off a piece of it and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> the first picture, <thing>, like. <laughs> Chris can tell you more, probably. <laughs> Yes, the, uh, the second uh, Apollo landing, Apollo 12, landed next to Surveyor 3, and they snipped off a few pieces, including the TV camera, brought them back to Earth. And, uh, I was only kidding, but okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. And um, uh, one of the reasons they did that was because Apollo 11 had kind of landed a, a few miles away from where they wanted it to. And they wanted to prove that they could land right on their target. So, uh, so they landed it near Surveyor, and uh, yes, and then we had the uh, Lunacod rovers. I can't remember they launched a couple of them, uh, but I can't remember if they actually operated uh, at the same time the astronauts were there. Um, and you know, of course, recently the Chinese have landed a couple of rovers on the moon. And uh, and then more recently, they landed their own rover on Mars. Uh, at, you know, in the, the earlier this year. Mm -hmm. So there's a uh, there's a lot of rover action going on right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're getting towards the end of the night. So um, I yeah, think we got to so... move things along to our uh, EAA folks. Thank you, everyone who was answering questions, and <laughs> that was that was a wonderful session. So thank you very much. Yes. Thanks for curating some questions for us, Amy. Thank you, Ruhi. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Wes. And thank you, Chris. All right. Let's pass things over to David for EAA. Hi, everyone. Uh, so this is the last EAA session for the year. So I thought we would uh, just do a quick um, kind of retrospective of the year. There were some pretty amazing photographs from this year. Uh, and also, we thought we'd... Uh, kind of look at a bit of a, a processing kind of comparison with the Lagoon Nebula. And then we're gonna finish off with uh, Dave Payne uh, showing us uh, the reason why we stretch, stretch our images. So anyways, I just wanted to introduce everybody. Uh, so we got, I think we have Dan Posey still with us. Uh, Dan's gonna present something. Uh, we also have um, uh, Brock Johnson and then of course uh, Dave Payne. So these folks have been with us. Uh, well, actually, uh, Dan kind of joined us partway through the year, but uh, uh, Brock and Dave have been with us uh, for the whole year. So uh, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, I think maybe we'll just uh, go through Dan, Brock, and Dave with uh, just some of their favorite picks, and then we'll we'll do the uh, the special features on the two two objects. So why don't you go ahead, Dan? Okay, hey, so good evening, everybody. Let me just fire up a screen share here for a second, and I'll pop into my first target for the evening. So it's it's always tough to pick a picture uh, to chat about it, but I thought I'd do a nice callback to uh, one of the shots that I took uh, earlier on around, I think it's almost February. And just to check, everybody can hear me, right? Good. Okay, so this is a California nebula. I don't think that anybody could ever guess where it gets its name from. Uh, if you just turn it on its side, that is anyway. Uh, but why I wanted to, to look at this one is it's, it's one of those nice targets to think about for what we can do from a reasonably light polluted location as amateurs. Um, one of the reasons why I joined the EAA group halfway through the year is that I'm usually up on Saturday nights for the public nights operating the Plaskett and uh, using that to show uh, folks uh, a nice tour of the night sky. But of course, with the pandemic and with weather the way it is, it hasn't always lined up or cooperated uh, for our schedule. Just like tonight was a good example where there was a brief window where it looked like it might clear up. And so I was preparing to tuck on some boots and go up to the hill and then the weather uh, looked a little bit dicey. So apologies everybody for not getting to do that. This target here is uh, shot with a amateur telescope, nothing too fancy, and a what is a, essentially a DSLR camera. What was different about this one and why I thought it was a good place to, to start a feature tonight is that 
it, it's just the use of filtration. I was able to put some new filters on the front of it that allow us to isolate out a few regions of the spectrum. I wouldn't say that they're so narrow as to be um, terribly narrow band or anything like that, but it bypasses a lot of the light pollution that we have. And in just a couple hours, I was able to produce some really nice depth um, from an area not too far from downtown Victoria. Uh, this is a hydrogen alpha region uh, in Nebula. So uh, a lot of the, the red that you're seeing here is hydrogen. If you were to look at it with more discrete filters, you would be able to pull out some uh, oxygen, this blue tinge that you get up here and a little bit of it uh, kind of shining out through the center. That would all be oxygen emission. And um, aside from that, you also get some sulfur too, if you really go deep on it. But uh, Dan, 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 oh, this yeah. is from your urban urban site. No, this one was uh, from from the the observatory grounds, but um, the California Nebula is still quite faint, and it's very wide field. This is about right. a three degree field of view, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's where where even though there isn't as much light pollution from the DAO site as there is downtown. Um, when you're shooting uh, toward the kind of southwest, which is where I was shooting this one, right as it goes across uh, the mountain line, uh, you do get uh, a fair bit of interference that can still crop up. And um, in this case, using filters was the smartest way to go. I don't think that the moon was up that night, but it might have been as well. And that's the other use case for any kind of filtration, is it allows you to get past um, past interference from moonlight. Yeah, I think I think most of the group is really. Uh, taking advantage of these uh, these filters now to get the results that they're getting. So let me just quickly turn to the other object I was going to chat about. So this is one from the the Plasket, because I always like to uh, show an image with the Plasket. And Dave, David, I might be jumping ahead to our Dark Nebula portion. So if you want, I can uh, drop screen share and leave that till the end. But Yeah, uh, let, let's, let's leave it to the end, and we can uh, sure just thing. do dark stuff near the end. So I'll pass it off. I just wanted to chat about the California Nebula for a second. Um, and again, going back to it, it's a beautiful target. It's one that unfortunately we don't get a chance to see as much with the naked eye. But if you were to look for where this is in the night sky, it's really close to the Pleiades star cluster, the Seven Sisters. Uh, I hope there's an image of that coming up. And um, it's, it's one of those lesser known uh, features there. Just to give you an idea of the proximity, I did have something along those lines, I think, right here. So quite close by. Anyway, Great. I will stop there and pass along. Great, thanks. Uh, Brock, you want to show us your picks? Sure. Share my screen. Can anyone see Jupiter? Yes. OK. Yeah, so uh, this year, um, one of my goals was to get some good planetary photos and it's um, planets are a bit tougher, I think, than deep sky objects because they, they're they way more dependent on seeing. And, you know, you, you can get a reasonably good picture of a nice colorful nebula with reasonably bad seeing, but you can't get anything other than a smudge of a planet unless you have absolutely incredible seeing. So there was a lot of wasted nights out there this summer trying to capture Jupiter. But I did manage to get, I think this was actually uh, August 23rd was an especially good night. And I got this image of Jupiter. And um, this would have been done with a bunch of uh, video files where I would do about a minute long videos, numerous of them, and then combine them all, stack them and combine multiple video images. And it's quite a bit of work, but it ended up working out reasonably clearly. So. Uh, Brock, uh, Brock, another another factor in planetary work is the altitude at which you image. Uh, were yes. you able to image these at fairly high? Uh, high up, as in when the planet is high in the sky. Yeah. yeah, I mean it was. I mean for us, it's it's never that high. I've seen pictures right. of people in Australia shooting Jupiter directly overhead, and kind of been jealous of that. But uh, it was probably thirty five degrees above the horizon. So not bad, but definitely could have been better. Yeah, that's good for us. Yeah. And then the next shot is of Saturn. And these were actually done the same night. I just kind of hopped back and forth 
got a minute or two of Jupiter and then a minute or two of Saturn. And so the scene was good, of course, that night. So I got reasonably good shots of both. I love Saturn and uh, it's definitely one of my favorites, especially with an eyepiece. When the seeing is good and you're actually looking at it directly, it's always mind blowing for me. So um, definitely enjoyed getting these two images. And, uh, and then uh, this was one of the ones that we reviewed as a team and I really enjoyed. This is the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. I think Ruhi also mentioned that this one, she liked the look of it when we were going through them. I don't know if she wants to comment on, on what's happening here, or, but um, this is actually done in the, well, my rather poor attempt at the Hubble palette. It's probably more green than the Hubble palette normally would be, but I always find the Hubble palette a bit strange and that you use the most abundant color, turn it green and then try to get rid of it. So I just left it green because I was just being a, a rebel, but uh, it's, um, it, I think it's a really nice looking object. And yeah, this was uh, one of my- Ruhi, I think you're muted. Oh, is Ruhi trying to say something? I think she's trying to say something. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, she should be okay now. No. She wasn't Not muted on Zoom. You. No, I don't know what's going on. We're not hearing you at all, Ruhi. Oh, no. There oh, we go. Now, now it's working. What <laughs> 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 like, myself? Oh, no. OK, good. Wonderful. OK, I absolutely right. adored this picture. So I'm glad I'm glad it's in the uh, in the selection. Um, Just a little bit about the elephant trunk. So it's a concentration of interstellar gas and dust um, with largely ionized gas. So that's why you're seeing all of this green emission. Um, but you're also seeing a lot of that dust and gas. So it's um, where all of this dark kind of nebula is, is all of that dust where the actual optical light cannot uh, permeate through it. So it's about 2,400 light years away from us. Um, and it is a large site of star formation. So there's a lot of young stars that are being born in this nebula. Um, with a lot of old, with some older stars actually in this. If you look to the very top of the image and like that circle, um, there's two older stars in there actually. They're like the oldest stars in the nebula while well, you'll have younger stars scattered throughout it. Um, and because of the um, older stars that are compressing the nebula as well as the stellar wind from the younger stars, it's causing a lot of pressure in it, which is actually where all this star formation is. So you're having a lot of protostars being born um, in the nebula as well. And throughout this one, you'll be able to see a lot of dark, dark spots, which are dense globulars of um, like interstellar gas. So these are like so dense that they're protected that mo like optical light cannot go through this as well, which is really cool. And I guess we'll talk more about dark nebulas later. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about dark st structures uh, later on in the session. Yeah, that's great. Um, Brock, did you have nice. anything else? I do, yeah. I've got the Helix Nebula, which nice. was actually one of my bucket list targets. This was also a bit challenging because it's very low in the horizon. It's, I don't think it got much over about 20 degrees through sort of August, but it's uh, similar to the Ring Nebula, but it's much closer and it's also much larger. So that sort of those two things combined end up making it a much more prominent target size-wise in field of view. Um, and it's basically a dying star. You can actually see in the center, there's a white dwarf that's basically emitting a ton of probably UV light that's making the rest of the uh, oxygen, which is sort of the cyan and the red, which is the hydrogen alpha emissions. Um, you're getting excited by that uh, high energy uh, ultraviolet light being thrown off by the white dwarf in the center. And uh, I was really happy with this because it's got also there's a faint shock wave that's kind of further out, which I was able to capture. And uh, yeah, that's 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 really nice, Brock. I most of the time when we see the helix, you don't see that part. Yeah, I'd hope to get more hours on it and to get that even more defined. But uh, maybe next year I'll get more data and I'll combine it together. And this one is the uh, crescent nebula, and this is a. a actually another similar thing that's basically gas being ejected from a star, but this is a Wolf-Rayet star. Um, I think this is up in Cygnus. 
and um, yeah, I think this, it's near it's near Sa Seder, near near the yeah. Seder region. Yes. And this one, actually, I was happy that I was able to get a lot of the um, the sort of the cyan areas, which are the uh, oxygen emissions, as well as the red hydrogen. And there's this really nice faint sort of outline of the oxygen regions throughout it, and then wisps within it. And, and there's actually an odd little dark region. So we're going to have a bit more of a discussion about dark gas or dark dust later, but this little blotch in the middle, I actually thought was some sort of a defect in my image initially, but it's actually, I've seen it in every other image of this. So it's clearly a real thing that's not just a smudge. So, and I think okay. that, oh yeah, I have one more before the dark discussion. And my last one was um, actually, I'm a huge fan of galaxies because they're just, they're always mind blowing, like glowing dust and, Hydrogen and stuff is beautiful and everything, but like this is an actual galaxy with billions of stars and it has its own nebulae within it. Like there's these beautiful glowing red nebulae and billions of stars and probably billions of planets and a bunch of astronomers and whatever species happen to be in that galaxy. Anyways, it's amazing to look at these things. Think about how massive they are. Very nice. Great, uh, thanks, Brock. Um, uh, David, um, uh, Matt, let's go through yours, and then uh, maybe there, there's um, three things that we were planning on talking about tonight, uh, kind of like dark structures. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about stretching and a little bit uh, about a review of the lagoon. So I don't know which one you want to start with. Why don't you do your photos first, and then we'll we'll go through the cycle. Well, I have uh, combined. Uh... I've combined my talk about pictures with the dark stuff. So hopefully I can. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe people could just off. jump in really fairly quickly. So the first image I have, is it sharing? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yep. Is uh, my mo one of my more recent images. Um, and that's uh, everyone should be uh, aware where that one is in the sky. It's the Pleiades. Um, and. Uh, the, the, the reason I wanted to show this is leads into the, the dark discussion. And this is what happens when you have a dark nebula and a, and a star cluster moves through it. Um, the, the stars actually uh, light up and, and uh, light bounces off and is scattered by the dust that's in, in the region. And uh, the dark nebulosity becomes lit up and that's a reflection nebula and uh, generally it takes on the color of the stars that are lighting it up the Pallades stars are all nice young stars um, um, blue um, very bright stars and so the dust takes on that uh, that blue hue of the stars very nice the second one, and this is the oldest uh, image I'm going to show, and I really don't like showing old images because I look at them and say, oh, I should have done this differently. But uh, this was taken a year ago. Um, um, and I don't think I've had a chance to take a, another picture of that this year due to the clouds. But it's the Horsehead and Flame Nebula in, in Orion. And the actual Horsehead is one of the most photographed uh, nebula in the sky, one of the most photographed things in the sky. And it's actually formed by a dark nebula that's in front of an emission nebula. So the emission nebula is a little bit different from the reflection in that it's actually absorbing likely UV light. And then that's exciting the electrons in, in around the, the gases in this case, mainly hydrogen gas, and that's causing it to re-emit light in a specific wavelength in its spectra. The whole thing, the whole thing is really emitted by this star, um, this Alan attack. That's the leftmost star in, uh, in Orion's belt. So if you want to know where this is, 
where this is actually from. So Dave, Dave, did you have a lot of trouble controlling the brightness of the star in the field? Um, I mean, it is it's so so bright compared to the rest of the other areas. Yeah, it, it, it is a very bright object and you can see it does have a halo around it. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, you ha when, when you're doing your stretching, you have to be careful that not to make the star so bright that it dominates everything else. But you mm -hmm. still want to um, be suggestive of how bright it really is. So it does become a challenge in some, some circumstances. The Pleiades was actually a bit of a challenge because the stars are so bright. Um, they all come with halos around them. The, the, the next image is one of my own favorites that I took um, because it's essentially a symphony of all these three kinds of, of uh, nebulosity. You can see near the top, all this blue reflecting off these stars up here. Then we've got a mission, these reds all through here and forming uh, nice patterns in the, in the interstellar winds that are going on. And then it looks like someone's um, come across with some real dark nebulosity over on the right-hand side. That's kind of like ink being spilled over the, the other nebulosity on, on both ends. Um, and it not only blots out nebulosity, it's blotting out the stars behind it. Hmm. Um, the, the next image, this was on your request, Dave, is the, is the tulip nebula. And, and it's also formed by a mixture of emission nebula and dark nebula. And it's actually forming a, a front as it's being blown around by the, by the stellar winds here. There's also a, um, another feature of this image that, that I quite like. You can see a purple arc through this side. And this is uh, the result of uh, actually X-rays um, pushing um, molecules around like a, a bow front. You can't actually see the X-ray source because it's a black hole. Um, and you probably heard of it, Cygnus, Cygnus X1. I think it's one of the brightest X-ray right. sources in the sky. Yeah, that's quite a famous uh, area. And the final one um, that I was going to show is the Iris Nebula. It, it, the, the reflection part of this nebula is actually uh, what forms the shape, shape of the iris itself. But you can see it's actually um, reflecting um, from what is otherwise dark nebula that we can see gathering around the edges as the reflection light um, dissipates around it. Interesting. So those are a few of my favorites. So, so Dave, do you want to bring up the uh, the lagoons? Oh, there you go. So here are the lagoons, and we one of us showed one of these. I can't remember who. Um, and I mentioned that I, both Dan, Brock, and I have all took some of Dan's data and uh, processed it. Do you want to? Speak from here, Dave. Yeah, you want you, you want to just start, uh, Dan, since it's your initial image. Sure. So I'm uh, I'm there on the top left, and Dave, maybe if you could just zoom in a bit uh, to let um, the central feature come out, because that's one of the problems that we have with uh, looking at <sighs> looking at narrow band data is that you don't always get such a nice result once you stray away from the emission areas themselves. Uh, it's often uh, tough to get signal in the background. And so I shot this from a, a downtown co condo balcony in Victoria over the summer, just experimenting with, uh, with a, a camera I'd picked up, which was a, 
a bit dated, but I figured it was a, a good project to work on. And uh, we have a nice low southerly view. So this is uh, shot using the Hubble palette, which means it's a combination of three narrowband filters. And narrowband filters are just very uh, specific filters that filter out almost everything except for very uh, small slices of the, the spectrum or the rainbow. In this case, the image was formed out of uh, hydrogen, alpha, oxygen three, and sulfur two. All three of those are emission lines. Dave's described the emission process, which is where a uh, bright star is going, or in this case, a uh, series of stars, uh, an entire cluster being formed, and, and more beyond that in the star forming region are exciting the gas and dust uh, around them, creating that uh, level of excitement. And then the gas and dust, once excited or ionized, is going to let off uh, excited electro electrons at these very predictable and specific wavelengths. So that's what I was able to capture. And because of that technique, I was able to filter out almost all of the light pollution from Victoria, because even though I'm sitting right downtown, when you're only looking at you know six or seven nanometers out of the uh, 400 or so, 300 nanometer wide visual spectrum, almost all of the human caused light goes away and we get this really incredible increase in contrast. So for this one, I went with more of a traditional, I guess, I don't know if you can call anything about false color imaging traditional, but a, a traditional mapping and uh, Hubble palette approach. So uh, to create color from black and white cameras isn't uh, always quite so easy as it is when we're using RGMB, so red, green, and blue is our base. In this case, you have to assign each of those uh, channels or each of those emission lines, the type of gas, to a color. And so I took oxygen and threw it to blue. I took uh, hydrogen, threw it to green. And then I took the sulfur and put it to red. And uh, just like Brock has aptly uh, demonstrated, hydrogen tends to be the most dominant um, of the three by far. If you were to look at this picture and just let them all be stretched at the same amount, it would be nothing but green. And that's because there's hydrogen is not only the most abundant element in the universe, but it also tends to be the one that uh, we see the most uh, vividly when we look at the night sky. It's why so many things are red. So in this case, I'm going to confess something here that I don't think that I've actually confessed some, so far, which is that I swung a hammer at it and uh, removed, I think, almost all of the green. There's still a little bit in there, but most of it's gone. And the, the intent of that was to leave all of the structure contributed by the hydrogen, but to let the more delicate structures of the sulfur and of the oxygen pop through. And so um, because we're uh, all members of the Royal Astronomical Society, and one of the things that we like to do is uh, sometimes toss our data around and let other people play with it, it's a great example of how different uh, astrophotographers and different um, perspectives can reimagine how we look at the same target. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over and um, let whoever's next jump in. Yeah, I guess uh, one of the aspects of this is the fact that uh, yeah, you get all your data and that becomes your uh, musical score. But I mean, you, you get to play it in lots of different ways. So uh, I don't know who wants to go next. Uh, Dave, did you want to go next or does Brock? Shoot. Sure, whatever you like. I, I just wanted to point out that, you, you, you know, when, when we start dealing with specialized filters, not only does it um, um, restrict you and you can't get the true colors out, but it's also freedom to pick whatever palette you want. So one of the most striking difference between these pictures is that they're different, different palettes. And it's kind of our choice, more or less. Um, so does it really look like that? Well, you can't really see these filters with your eyes anyways, um, that well. So it doesn't look like any one of these three palettes. Um, but you can see the, 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 the design of the whole, what we were after were three different things from the same data emphasizing different aspects of, of the same object. Um, I, mine is in the upper right there. I have purple in the middle instead of blue in the middle. Um, and the, the outer sides, I, I left more red. 
Um, but also I was trying to get more of the star field. I was trying to get more of the background um, dark nebula that was around, around the lagoon itself. And then um, Brox is in the middle. So. Yeah, you want to jump yeah. in, Brock? Sure. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to take a bit more of a picking. I was using as close to the actual colors as uh, as I could. And of course, sulfur and hydrogen are both red. So, um, you know, that sulfur is a deeper red than hydrogen. But because they're both quite red, I actually made the hydrogen a little bit more orange and then basically put the uh, oxygen into more of a, a cyan, which is a mix of blue and green, and tried to do as close to sort of a, I guess what you might call a natural color as, as, as I could, and uh, just as a contrast to the others. And uh, I, think, I think it's really, really cool to see the way they all, it's quite a marked difference in the way they're interpreted, but they're all just gorgeous images. And, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And there's certainly lots of rooms for, you know, individual interpretation. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so there's there's two things left. Um, does anybody want to add to the comments that Dave made originally about dark structures? Now, now, Rui, I don't know if you did any re research into this, but there's probably lots of reasons why things are dark. Yeah, um, so a lot of it is mostly just interstellar gas and dust. So we, mm. it'll gravitationally bind to each other, so it'll get really dense. Um, light will not be able to pass through it. Um, so you won't be able to see anything behind it. And like, especially in the pictures that you were just showing us, I was able to see a lot of like isolated patches of um, dark nebulae. And I'm pretty sure those are uh, Bach globules. Oh. I don't know if I'm saying that right, um, but it's B-O-K globules. Um, so there are isolated patches of dark nebulae and they're so dense that it obscures optical light. They can be as large as around 10 solar masses and about a light year across. Um, and they usually end up um, with the formation of like binary or multiple star systems. So usually when you see oh. dark nebulae, you're gonna have star formation because um, it condenses everything together. Like even in my own research, when I'm studying protostars, um, I can't see them with optical light. I have to use um, like near infrared or radio because in where these stars are forming, it's so condensed and all of this gas is just so condensed around it that optical light from the star itself can't escape. It's mm -hmm. stuck in there. The only thing that can is the like lower energy near infrared light that can. So that's usually when you're gonna see dark nebulae or Bach globules, you're going to have star formation, which is really important, you know, into making galaxies and new stars. Hmm. Interesting. Ruhi, how, how small are the dust particles? Tiny. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so tiny. There is so much dust in our universe. Um, okay. But it's almost like when Wes was talking about creating planets, like it just snowballs into these larger formations. Um, so you're going to have a I, I can't even think of the amount of dust particles in an actual number because it's like boggling. It's mind boggling. Um, there's a lot of dust in our universe. Yeah. There's so a lot it's, of dust. it's mainly minerals and maybe some hydrocarbon molecules and- Yeah. You'll have a lot of dust. You'll have a lot of molecules, especially with, um, with star formation. You're gonna have a lot of hydrogen. You're gonna have a lot of CO, like uh, 12 CO, 13 CO, um, 12 CO, those are usually your tracers for star formation in these dark nebulae. Are they mostly condensates, like from gas emissions that eventually cons condense? And... I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not completely sure, or 100% sure, but I think so. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, so I think we only have one item left. Uh, I think Dave is gonna show us uh, something about stretching. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, the audience is aware, but uh, basically a lot of these images, when we start them off and we get the initial images, uh, they don't really, um, the, the, the tone values are typically bunched up on one side of the possible tones. So we have to perform this uh, 
function called stretching. So yeah, they turn out, start off dark like this. And then we actually have to stretch the tones out to actually see the different uh, shapes and colors. So you go ahead, Dave. Sure. So yeah, what, what, what we take pictures of is really dark, the sky. Um, so we end up taking very long exposures. Sometimes we leave the shutter open um, three minutes, sometimes 15 minutes, depending on what filters we're using and, and how bright the object is. And because they're so dark, there's a lot of noise involved. So to get rid of that, we take a, take a whole bunch of pictures over an entire night, possibly over a few nights even. Um, and then uh, we uh, empty all these images out of our camera and then we go to look at them. And there are three things, uh, main things that we have to do to, to get our final image. Um, the first is we have to take all these images and align them with the stars, make sure the stars are in the same spot. And then we average them. And then that averaging takes out a lot of the noise that we get. But the second main thing we have to do is then we pull it up on the screen and all we can see here is the, the brighter stars in the image. And we have to stretch it in order to be able to see it. And then the third thing we do and what we spend most of our time doing is everything else to make the image look the way we want it to. But just to give you an idea, you know, the first time you look at an image you take and you, you might initially think you're disappointed because, well, all I got is the stars and I can actually, this is the Pleiades again, and I can actually see those stars better with my eye than through a telescope or, or a camera. And over on the right hand side here, I've got a little program that does, does stretching and what you can see is um, this is supposed to be a histogram of the brightness of all the pixels in the image. And what you can, you, you, you don't see anything there. You see this Y equals X line, but you don't see any pixels there. And then it's because they're all bunched up on the far left-hand side. So I'm going where the pixels are really dark. Well, I do know that we have a whole bunch of dark pixels here. So let me zoom in on that part of the, the, the histogram. And what we wanna do with something like this is we want to basically stretch that histogram over the entire um, range that it can go. And we have certain transformations we can make to do that stretch. But what I'll, what I'll just do is change a couple of parameters here and I will start to stretch that histogram and you can see this was where the histogram originally is and this is where I'm stretching it to and I have to actually zoom out. So normally uh, normally when you have a terrestrial image like one straight out of your camera of an object uh, it typically has a, almost like a kind of a bell curve so there's a, a, a just a little bit of black a little bit of white and then everything's in between so we're attempting to true it up or normalize it so that it looks more yeah. like that. So this is where I can actually see the pixels in this, in this range. So then I execute that. And all the stuff that's behind the, behind the image starts to be visible. Um, so now I can actually see, oh, that's where all that nebulosity and, and things are. Um, but my histogram still is kind of bunched more or less in the middle. I would like to widen that out and increase the contrast in the image. So I'm just going to do one more stretch here. Put this in the middle of my histogram and decrease that stretch quite a bit. So now I'm stretching that histogram wider to cover more of the image. And then if I execute that, you start to get a, 
uh, a more reasonable image. Still, it's a little bright in this one. And you can actually see I'm bringing out the noise now that's behind the darkness. And then with a couple more adjustments, you end up pretty close to what the, um, what the final image Well, that's my version of the final image of that data is. Yeah, so really there's there's a fair bit of work involved after the initial acquisition. Um, uh, that's something we don't always talk about, but that's, uh, that's a big part of this is the time involved afterwards. David, I have a question. How yes. long do you think like doing any of these pictures would actually take like in hours? Yeah, I was gonna ask each person to talk about that, but uh, time uh, actually can, I mean, you're not necessarily actively involved in watching it build. Uh, you can pretty well set up the shot, you know, grab all your frames and you can kind of walk away, typically walk away from that. Right. Um, the assembly is a different story. And I was going to ask each person approximately how much assembly time is involved. You, you want to go ahead, Dan? Sure. Um, it's a, Tough question because it constantly changes with the technology you're using and what you're trying to do. Um, one of the one of the images, maybe I'll just flash it up for a second uh, that I was going to show on on Dark Nebula, but I don't want to uh, spend too much time on it because we're running low. Was this shot of the wide field around Orion, and um, it's just an interesting region because there's quite a lot going on. But this was shot by a few hundred thirty second exposures. The image of the lagoon was uh, quite a few longer uh, exposures, but it was 12 hours of narrowband. And so what you're feeding in always changes how long it takes to render it down and often changes the processing time as well. So I usually, uh, oh, and how fast your computer is matters on top of that. So I just got a very fast computer that I built myself uh, last year, which has cut it down. I'd say for a lot of those images, it would probably be 10 to 15 hours of processor time plus uh, actual time working on it back then with uh, you know a, a five or 800 uh, frame stack from a 30 megapixel camera. Now I've cut that down to about three hours, but um, maybe two and a half, but it's still significant depending on what you're doing. Um, long answer is it can be as long as you really want because if you count tinkering time and going back and forth in there, then uh, you <laughs> run on a very slippery slope. But um, so, so Ruhi, you probably heard uh, a few of the folks uh, tonight say that they plan on adding more data. Well, that is kind of a normal thing. Uh, you might get a bunch and you might spend 10 hours on it, but you may end up getting even more data later and adding more stuff in. I see. So it's almost like a never ending process. <laughs> it can be. It can be for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's kind of acquisition time is one thing. And then um, processing time, like the actual time you're working with it, isn't all that long. It's just that you often have to wait for each step to complete before you can go on to the next one. And that's where. Um, just as I'm sure you're familiar with uh, working with your research um, systems, that it can be a bit of a hurry up and wait process. If you mm -hmm. step out, grab a cup of coffee, I, I promise anybody who wants to type, try it, it uh, goes much quicker that way. Anyways, I think I'm getting the signal to try to wrap here. So I, I think, um, yeah, I, I just want to thank everybody. Uh, I want to thank the UVic team of uh, Ruhi is just one of the, the three people that we had this year. And thank Dan and Brock and, and Dave for providing all these beautiful pictures this year. And, and I thought what I would end up with is uh, Dan just asked, uh, not Dan, Don just asked me uh, if I would show my comet picture. So I'm gonna end with that. Uh, so it's just a quick image of a comet letter that I caught about almost two weeks ago. It's not a great image, but uh, I can tell you a little bit of a story as I go out. So let me just uh, do the share here. So I, I just went out really early in the morning. It was in a really bad time of the morning. It was just like four or five o'clock in the morning. So it was just before dawn. But I just pointed my camera. I, I tried looking for it with my telescope and with binoculars, but I, I kind of failed. So I just pointed my camera out at it with a tracker 
and I managed to see it. It was just around, just above Arcturus at the time. This is on December 5th, I believe. So you, you can actually see the comet here. It has that kind of characteristic kind of green color. And you could also see some other objects here. This is not really easy to see, but there's NGC 5466. And here's a blow up of M3 here. So yes, it is possible to see the comet, but it wasn't easy. <laughs> so anyways, uh, yeah, again, I, I thank thanks the whole crew for this year. Uh, we're looking forward to coming back next year. Excellent. Thanks for an excellent wrap for our, uh, for the, our year of star parties. Um, thanks to all the EAA crew and Ruhi. And uh, I want to leave us off with a teaser for next month's uh, star party. Uh, we'll be uh, learning about the RASC World Asterisms Project. Um, one of the, the uh, folks at the National RASC has um, been working through the pandemic to collect um, asterisms. So basically constellations from um, many, many other cultures uh, to build a big library of uh, constellations and stories from all over the world. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that. Thank you, everyone. Have a happy solstice, a happy Christmas, a happy new year, um, a happy any holiday you celebrate. And we will see you all uh, in January. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thanks to everybody. You're awesome. <laughs> good night. <laughs>